uh, that they're going to get done. And it's a, they could be taking a huge step toward that today. Yet we're focused and everybody's focused on Michael Flynn uh, pleading guilty to lying to the FBI, which is uh, a huge story uh, on another. I mean, the, the cloud of the Russia investigation uh, just continues to linger over this White House and over this president. We knew that from the very beginning. Uh, and it's continuing every time one of these shoes drops. This is a this is a huge story, and and you know no matter what else is going on in Washington, that's big. Uh, these stories are always going to overshadow uh, what else is happening. And it's not through any direct fault of the president's. This is just how the investigation is progressing. Yeah. This happens to be a pretty big deal with Mike with Michael Flynn being the the center of this, uh, but. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, from a political standpoint. I think unfortunate for for Republicans. At least they're going to feel that way because this is something that they uh, are are happy about passing uh, this tax bill through the Senate today. Uh, it's something that they are going to tout. But you know, they're going to from a political standpoint, they're going to continue uh, to tout that. They're going to they're going to continue to talk to their supporters and their donors and say, look, we're actually getting our work done despite this quote witch hunt or whatever mm -hmm. the president calls this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a White House Christmas party this afternoon. You think this is all going to come up there? Oh, uh, well, I guess we'll <laughs> see, right? It's supposed to be off the record, so if it does come up, uh, I'm not sure anybody's going to be talking about it. Very interesting. So uh, stand by for us, uh, Steve. We have Leslie uh, Sanchez on the phone. Uh, Leslie, uh, you are a CBSN contributor, uh, and you have uh, helped us guide us through all of this stuff before. So when you heard about Michael Flynn uh, accepting a deal here for uh, providing um, misleading information to the FBI, what did you think? I think it's a very bad day for the Trump administration. Um, you know, basically, this situation has moved itself into the president's office. And I say that because this is somebody who was intimately involved in the campaign, in the transition, as you remember, Anne-Marie, and then in the first days of the administration. So regardless of what side of the aisle you sit on, it, it's going to be a really difficult thing not only to talk about, but it's just the beginning. I mean, we. I think there. I've talked to uh, some Republican legislators on background this morning, and one said, "You know, we're in the fetal position over here. We, mm. They're not quite sure what's going to happen next, but they do agree that this is the beginning because you still have sentencing. Um, now, Flynn has some obligations to fulfill. He's going to testify, um, and, and basically, you know, as one pointed out, to come back with basically such small. Uh, it's such a, a, a smaller uh, issue. Uh, one characterized it as to walk into the bank with a big deposit so he could draw, you know, just a, a, a lesser charge. Right. Uh, so they feel that there really is that cloud, and the cloud is getting bigger and darker. Is there anyone else who would have been bigger than Michael Flynn just because he's been at the center of so much? You know, it's hard to say that. It, it, the, the point that well, people will come back to is he's the one person who the president has failed to criticize. Mm. And there's going to be conspiracy theories you know, here and there, and people will want to make more of it. But I think if you're just following piece by piece how this goes, it really is what are, we don't know what the deal is, right? But what is he going to, uh, to, to share? What yeah. information? And it's that uncertainty that makes it difficult for the administration to move forward, especially at critical legislative time. So if you were advising the administration at this point in terms of what sort of messaging they want to put out, their messaging prior to this has been, this is a witch hunt, has been that, you know, if anything was done, if there, if, if Michael Flynn participated in any, anything un, untoward, it was certainly wasn't while he was part of the administration, it would have happened uh, prior. You know, what sort of messa messaging do they give now? You know, I think it remains consistent. Uh, these could be independent actions that were taken, uh, you know, without knowledge by the campaign, um, by the president, by the senior leadership. But uh, as as this unfolds, that's going to be questioned. I think that's really the only position you can take, uh, especially when you had somebody so intimately involved. Like I talk about it, you know, it's now made its way uh, as somebody who was so intricate to the campaign at an early stage very much willing influence during the transition. So uh, the only choice you have is to continue to say he worked independently um, right. and, and we were not aware of any of that knowledge. Right. Well, I am watching the president's Twitter feed so far, nothing, but I'm sure later on today he will weigh in in some way, shape or form. Uh, Leslie Sanchez, uh, Steve Chigaris, thank you so much for joining me, guys.
we are going to continue to cover this story. Uh, Michael Flynn, uh, former senior advisor uh, to the president, will be pleading guilty to providing uh, false information to the White House. Whether that plea deal comes with other things, we don't know. Whether he's assisting the Mueller investigation in other ways, we don't know. But we're going to cover this story, we're going to talk to the experts, and we're going to bring you all the information. You are streaming CBSN. Right now, we've got the app for that. This is CBSN. We're just on the front lines. The police have surrounded the area. It's still unclear what caused this fire, why it spread so quickly. There are flooded homes like the one behind me for miles. Change is what many people here are looking for. And now they're trying to pin the ISIS gunmen down. The marchers were saying, let us march. We want to march. CBSN. CBS News. Always on. Biggest names in politics. I have my own opinions, you can have your own opinion. But I want to know your opinions, you're the President of the United States. Face the questions you want answered. What do you tell Democrats who want a new direction? What keeps you awake at night? Nothing, I keep other people awake. Did any advisor or anybody in the Trump campaign have any contact with the Russians who are trying to meddle in the election? Oh, well, of course not. John, that is a very fair question. But let me ask you this, Senator, why not just have a pause? I'm not hearing you, Mr. President, say there's a guarantee of pre-existing We condition. actually have laws that guarantee Face the nation Sunday. Welcome back, everyone. We've been covering some breaking news. Former National Security Advisor to the President, Michael Flynn, 
is pleading guilty, guilty for providing uh, misinformation to the FBI, essentially lying to the FBI. Uh, he just walked into the courthouse uh, just moments ago, and I think we have video of that. He turned himself into the FBI earlier today and then walked into the courthouse. We're expecting him to plead guilty just a little bit later on. And this is very significant, significant in terms of the uh, Mueller investigation. Michael Flynn is perhaps the closest person to the president to be charged here. Michael Flynn was actively involved in the campaigning and he was also a member of the administration for a mere 24, 25 days before he was fired for live, live lying rather to the vice president. Uh, but this is what you call a big fish and some may think this is sort of the loose thread on the sweater, if you will, in terms of the investigation that pulling on uh, this thread, Michael Flynn, m making a deal with Michael Flynn uh, may lead to a number of other uh, arrests. Steve Chigaris is on the phone with me now. Steve, you've been uh, soaking all of this stuff up and following this all along. Let's just go uh, back in time a little bit and let people know just how significant Michael Flynn is, how close he has been to Donald Trump. Well, he was a trusted uh, surrogate and supporter of the president, worked for the campaign, campaigned on behalf of the president uh, throughout uh, the, uh, uh, the merely mostly the general election, but throughout the primaries as well, uh, and and then uh, advised him uh, on uh, on various issues. Became a member uh, of the president's transition team, and then was eventually hired to be a national security advisor in the White House. Uh, so this is a guy you mentioned the most significant to date. I would I, I would argue that Paul Manafort pretty significant as well, who's already um, uh, un, under uh, uh, a bit of tr in a bit of trouble with with Robert Mueller because he was the campaign manager. It's just his tenure with the president was much shorter than Flynn's. Flynn's probably lasted about a year. Manafort was uh, was in the uh, the Trump orbit uh, for several months only, and that's about it. And, but and still, both really of these guys now that this is the the these are two huge gets for yeah. Bob Mueller. It's so you've got Manafort first, and now Michael Flynn, and this is not like uh, they're dealing with small fish here. They're dealing with pretty significant folks who have uh, who would likely have pretty deep knowledge of what was going on in this campaign and during and, and, and in Flynn's case, what was going on during the transition uh, and at the beginning of this administration. The thing with uh, Manafort is that he hasn't pled guilty, so there probably hasn't been a deal struck with him. I don't know what will happen, obviously, moving into the future. But at least right now, it seems like Michael Flynn is cooperating. Correct. But, you know, but Manafort has been dragged into this and is, is going to be grilled uh, by, by Mueller uh, mm -hmm. on what he knows. And, again, you're starting to see uh, this investigation go after top people uh, in this campaign. Uh, and now, in this case, uh, in the transition in the administration. Now, uh, you know, you're going to hear the White House likely say something like, we fired Flynn when we found out that he lied to uh, Vice President Pence, uh, which, is, which is what happened. Uh, and it was shortly thereafter we discovered that he lied to the FBI. In, in, in telling the same story about whether he had contact with the Russian ambassador on December 29th. Uh, and so this is uh, what this all surrounds. Now the question is, is what else does Michael Flynn know uh, and who else uh, could be affected by all this? This is the big uh, $64,000 question to yeah. date myself with that reference. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the big question and, and we don't know. But uh, what we do know is that uh, Mueller feels that, he, that, that Flynn is valuable enough and has valuable enough information to at least start to uh, pull some more strings on some of these other uh, avenues where Mueller's trying to figure out who knows what, that Flynn can be helpful there. And so that's where this is going. I mean, it's very clear uh, that he didn't get charged with a lot of other things he could have been charged with. There's a laundry list of things he could have been charged with. Uh, and he wasn't charged with any of that stuff except for the lying to the FBI charge. And uh, that is a deal where, you know, I think this is, they, they hope it's going to bear fruit in terms of other information and other people who were involved in the campaign and in the administration. Indeed. Well, Steve, I know that you have to uh, get going. Uh, we're going to bring in uh, Leslie Sanchez, CBSN political contributor. Leslie, we've been talking about just how big of a deal this is for the Mueller investigation and how uh, this brings the, this closes the circle a, a little bit. The circle is a little tighter now in terms of that circle surrounding the president. Very true. I think Steve brought up a really interesting point when people are going to think about Michael Flynn and, and Paul Manafort. Two distinctly different people. They can say, oh, they're connected to the campaign. They were in the transition. 
um, or at least early in the campaign, Paul Manafort came in, as we recall, during the convention time with a very specific role that was looking at delegate count and ensuring that there was, you know, no shenanigans, so to speak, going on uh, during the Republican convention, and that he has just a very strong background of success doing that, and that was the purpose. Now, he, he was... Uh, it, he exuded a tremendous amount of influence, but it was easy to say, okay, we saw he had some under uh, other relate, suspicious relationships, didn't want to be part of that, and he was removed rather quickly, uh, as we recall. The difference with Flynn is he rode out that full year, um, you know, at, through the primary, through the transition, and all those very peculiar meetings and conversations, and then those first days of the administration. So there's a lot more there there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to be the question. And I think a lot of Republicans and Democrats, especially you know leaders on the Hill, are really wondering what's next um, and, and what's going to come up his testimony. Mm-hmm. And we know he, like you said, he was there at some key during some key meetings. We know that he was there when uh, Donald Trump Jr. met with a Russian attorney. He was one of the people that were called in to be in that meeting. Um, so he would be able to verify. Um, a number of different bits of information that other people who have been called in to speak to uh, the uh, special counsel's uh, investigators have been talking about. Uh, we're, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm thinking of um, uh, the, the the president's son-in-law a, as well as the president's son. Uh, you know, both of them have been accused of failing to fully disclose information. And what ends up happening is the investigation or sometimes members of the media churn up additional information. And then each time that happens, uh, they come forward and say, oh, yeah, I forgot. And they're not the only ones, but these are the sort of the two uh, key individuals that are particularly close to the president. Um, Michael Flynn could potentially put them in a pretty tough situation. It, it could happen. Um, I think critics of the president and the administration are going to say, you know, there it is, there's going to be a smoking gun. Nobody uh, really is jumping to that conclusion, but it is a dark cloud, uh, like we talked about for sure. And, and you can compare it to Mueller having a hammer over his head, um, over Flynn's head, because mm-hmm. he, uh, Flynn now has to fulfill the requirements of what that deal is. The deal. We don't know what that is. Yeah. He's going to have to testify, and until he's sentenced, uh, you know, we don't know what all those elements mean because he could still be charged, or his son could be charged, um, you know, with other types of crimes. So, uh, again, it's the beginning of that process, and and where it leads, we just don't know. But it will be a big issue through the spring. This is not going to end and wrap at the end of the year like some had hoped. Yeah, uh, you mentioned his son and there was some speculation that uh, the threat of charging his son um, was done deliberately to sort of encourage him to cooperate. His son was pretty actively involved in his businesses. There, There is um, some reporting on that and so it, it, it's becoming a family affair, <laughs> yeah. needless to say. But it, it, I, again, until we really know what the deal is, um, what the testimony is. Is he going to be before a grand jury? Until we know those things, I think uh, especially Republicans need to stay away from the microphones and, you know, just kind of focus, as it's going to be extremely difficult to do on this on key tax reform they're trying to do today. Again, it's undermining the ability that, to exchange political capital because there's such a media frenzy and speculation and suspicion about what this will mean in the future. Yeah, so once again, we're not talking about uh, tax reform, and actually it looks like the Senate is... Uh, making quick work of it. Uh, you know, at one point it looked like they would not be able to vote on this before the holiday, before uh, the holiday break. And they're sort of chugging along quite rapidly, but we're not talking about it at all. No, at a time at a critical moment, by yeah. the way. You know, uh, there's no doubt about that. And it, it, it's a difficult thing to push through rapidly. You know, many uh, Republicans are arguing that it, to a fair point, it's being done on the back of an envelope. I mean, they're just kind of developing it at this rapid pace, which is not normal order on the on the Hill. Um, and it, it causes uh, a lot of uh, 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 frustration because they don't know. It's the devil in the details. It always is. If you go back to the 80s, I mean, everybody was jumping on tax reform. Hmm. I mean, everybody wanted to be involved in something like this. Right now, it's, you know, one thing, you pull one pin and it causes the whole thing to fall down. They don't really know what they don't know. And and because of that, it still has some challenges moving forward 
Um, and unfortunately, the Republicans can't take the time to really move through in a, in a, in a normal order on this. And, and now you have this other added pressure. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult year but a, and a big task for Republicans today. Definitely. Uh, Leslie Sanchez, uh, CBSN a political contributor. Uh, we are going to continue to uh, cover this story. Uh, there's a lot of news happening today. Uh, former uh, advisor to the president, Michael Flynn, is pleading guilty to providing uh, misinformation to the FBI, to lying to the FBI. And uh, with that guilty plea, though, may come a deal. We don't know the details of that deal, but we sure do know that Michael Flynn knows an awful lot about this administration and about the campaign. And this is all under the um, umbrella of uh, Special Counsel Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN. Welcome back, everyone. We have been covering uh, breaking news all morning long. Michael Flynn is pleading guilty to lying to the FBI, uh, former advisor to the president, and perhaps one of the uh, closest people to the president to be uh, charged thus far. So far, four aides to the president have been charged, but Michael Flynn is the only one who participated in the campaign and was also part of the administration. You may recall, though, he uh, was fired 
murdered uh, in February after it became uh, after we learned that he lied to uh, the vice president about his contacts with Russian officials. But this is a significant, significant um, get, if you will, for the Mueller investigation. We learned uh, not too long ago that Michael Flynn's attorneys had stopped sharing information with White House attorneys. That was an indication that perhaps something was in the works that maybe Michael Flynn was hammering out a deal with the Mueller investigation. And now it looks to be perhaps the case uh, because he could have been charged. Uh, he could have faced a number of other charges. Instead, he's only been charged with uh, lying to the FBI. So the presumption is that there is some sort of exchange taking place. That video right there was uh, Michael Flynn just walking into the federal courthouse a little bit earlier, and he will be in a courtroom a little bit later on today. Standing by, uh, I think right outside of the what? White House there. I, can, I don't know if she can. Can you hear me, Jackie? Jackie Alamany standing by. Hey, hey there. Hey, Jackie. So this is really stunning news. Have we heard anything from the White House yet? No, the White House is still in bunker mode. Uh, White House Deputy Press Secretary Raj Shah told CBS News that the White House would not be commenting on the situation on Mike Flynn's indictment and uh, plea and instead referred us to uh, White House lawyer on the Russia investigation, Ty Cobb and John Dowd. Uh, we have not heard from those lawyers yet. Um, but again, uh, the news today upends the White House talking points that they've put forth over the past few months, which is that any criminal activity by Michael Flynn doesn't have anything to do with this White House or President uh, Trump. Um, but, you know, the White House bunker mode uh, can't last for too long today. The White House Press Christmas Party, an annual tradition that's held every year by the White House um, to have the press come back and enjoy some eggnog and holiday cheer uh, with White House staff is happening at 2 p.m. today. It is an off-the-record event, but President Trump will be addressing the press. Um, these, will, again, will be off-the-record remarks. Um, but it'll be interesting to see uh, the president, the way the president addresses the news of the day. Um, in March of uh, this past year, the president tweeted that the Russia investigation as it pertained to Mike Flynn was a witch hunt and that he should ask for immunity. Um, but there is potential for the president to, to pivot on his strategy here uh, and go after Flynn. Uh, as we know, Flynn was originally fired as NSA director for lying to Vice President um, Mike Pence on whether or not he reached out to the Russian ambassador to discuss uh, new sanctions on Russia. Uh, and it could very well, we could very well see this president um, pivot towards that and begin to call Mike Flynn uh, a liar. But uh, again, we haven't heard anything back from the White House. We don't expect to today. Um, if we do, we'll hear something from Ty Cobb. Well, this is certainly uh, very interesting, uh, and I, I expect the um, Christmas party will be somewhat uncomfortable. Um, but Michael Flynn is a significant character in this narrative. He was there during the campaign. He was there most significantly after as a member of the White House staff. Exactly, um, which is why that uh, you know again the the indictment today um, does upend mm -hmm. uh, the talking points that the White House has put forward, mm -hmm. um, which is that Michael Flynn did not commit any any criminal activity while he was uh, serving as the capacity of the National Security Advisor. Because if you look at the court documents released today, uh, it says that Mike Flynn lied to the FBI about talking to Russian Ambassador uh, Kislyak on January 24th. That was four days after inauguration while he was the National Security Advisor. Um, another scenario that we could see here was after George Papadopoulos pled guilty uh, in October, that was a former Trump campaign staffer for also lying to the FBI, um, sources close to the White House uh, urged the president to change tactics on lawyers, urged the president to layer John uh, Dowd and Ty Cobb, his two current lawyers handling the uh, Russia investigation. Um, so we'll also be on the lookout to see if there's any strategy changes uh, as regards to staffing. Um, so I'm just sort of looking at the timeline here to kind of like remind people of uh, Michael Flynn and his activities. Now, Michael Flynn was a of, became a, a man of concern even sort of prior to this he had accepted uh, money for to do work for the Turkish government which could be a conflict of, uh, of interest um, President Obama warned President Trump about keeping him on the staff as a national security advisor but President Trump chose to do that uh, nonetheless and the interview with the FBI happened on January 24th so that was 
after uh, the Trump administration had taken over and that's partially why this is so significant. Exactly. There were a, a litany of charges that Michael Flynn was facing and as um, our Paula Reed was able to confirm this morning. Um, you know, sources who are working on the case indicated to her that because of the very narrow scope of charges that uh, Flynn pled guilty to today, it does signify that Flynn potentially offered up significant information um, in exchange for this deal. Uh, we have obviously yet to see what that information is exactly, um, but if it does relate to the president himself, um, it could be potentially very damaging. And we know that the president's son-in-law very recently spoke with uh, investigators um, for special counsel Mueller. And what we learned, at least from some of the reporting, is a lot of the questions were focused on Michael Flynn. Yeah, uh, they were. And there's still a number of special counsel interviews that need to take place, which also jives up against what uh, Ty Cobb had been telling the press um, prior to today, which is that the investigation would be wrapped up by Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's almost Christmas time, and uh, this investigation uh, does not seem like it's coming to an end. No, it seems like it's just heating up. Uh, we learned, I think, last week that Hope Hicks may be somebody else who uh, they'll be calling in. She's been around for a long time. She knows the president quite well as, as well. Right. And what's very interesting about Hope, she's been a confidant of the president uh, since before the campaign. Um, and she is the president's right hand man. Um, and the president has been known to eschew uh, email and, you know, tech communication, uh, internet online communications. Uh, and Hope is generally that person who relays everything to the president firsthand. So she is a very important character uh, in this investigation um, as, you know, they're she has been by the president's side throughout every uh, every curve of, of these last 10 months mm -hmm. as president. So we're just starting to get a uh, reaction from Capitol Hill to the news that Michael Flynn is uh, going to be pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. Uh, we have a little bit of sound from uh, Senator Tim Kaine. Yeah, agreeing to this. Not, not surprised. Yeah, not surprised. Well, I, I think the, the, at least the quick report of the charge, it seemed obvious to me that he had made a lot of misstatements to a whole lot of people. And the frightening thing is this guy was the national security advisor of the United States and the key you know, foreign policy advisor of the president. When he, wanted, when he wanted to be briefed and classified during the campaign, Flynn was the guy that was in the room with him. So this is not a low-level functionary, but this is somebody who was at the highest levels of the campaign and also the highest levels of the administration. And during the campaign, he repeatedly said, lock her up, lock her up, referring to Hillary Clinton. What's your reaction to now him being guilty of these charges? Well, look, he, you know, he, he would not give the benefit of, of a fair legal process to anybody else, but he gets the benefit of fair legal process. So he has pled guilty, and the, you know, how, the, how that all resolves itself, whether there's additional potential charges or uh, what, you know, how how he has handled in this process. I mean, he will he will get the benefit of a fair process that he was unwilling to accord to anybody else. But it's a, it's very disturbing. That was uh, Democratic Senator uh, Tim Kaine. We are now looking at a video from uh, not too long ago of Michael Flynn uh, entering the uh, federal courthouse there. He uh, turned himself into the FBI a little bit earlier today. And of course, the breaking news is that Michael Flynn is pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. Uh, one charge of many charges that he could have been facing, though, many charges that he could have been facing, leading many people to speculate that he has hammered out a deal with the special prosecutor's office. What that deal looks like, what that means, what it is in exchange for, we really don't know. Michael Flynn is such a significant character here because he has been very close to the president for a long time and he was actively involved in the campaign, but he was also part of the administration. He was at present at a number of significant meetings, including that meeting with the president's son and a Russian attorney. Um, he knows a lot and uh, the special prosecutor getting him to cooper cooperate is quite significant. He is the fourth aide to be facing charges now. Uh, Paul Manafort is another sort of big, uh, big uh, fish, if you will, um, also being charged. The difference is it doesn't appear as if Paul Manafort, at least at this point, is cooperating with the special prosecutor's office. Uh, he's been charged, uh, a variety of charges, but they're really related to money laundering and fraud. Very different than what Michael Flynn is being charged with, uh, lying to the FBI here. Um, 
Paul Manafort is still trying to figure out how he can get out from out, out from under house arrest. So here we have uh, Michael Flynn turning himself in today and where this goes from here anyone knows earlier I spoke to our Jeff Begay's and asked him why Flynn is such a great get for the Mueller investigation because he straddles not only the first few weeks of the administration but also the transition period and the campaign. He was a top uh, campaign surrogate. He was often the one at these campaign events leading these chants of lock her up. They were of course referring to Hillary Clinton. And so he was there on the campaign trail during this period uh, where the FBI launched its investigation, which was around uh, July of 2016. So he was in the campaign at that point. And then, as I said, during the transition where there were contacts and this plea deal that we're talking about today, according to the court papers, it deals with this uh, December 29th call with Sergei Kislyak, the now well-known Russian ambassador who's since gone back to Mech uh, Moscow. Uh, but he is someone that was in contact with Mike Flynn uh, on the very day that the Obama administration announced sanctions against Russia. Sanctions that were a direct response uh, to this charge that the Russians interfered, meddled in the 2016 election. So that was the Obama administration sending a message to Vladimir Putin. And then well, what happened was Russia did not respond. They didn't retaliate. And I have sources and had sources at that time who, who said that, wow, that was weird. That was odd that Russia didn't retaliate and do something. And so there was a lot of concern at that point that there was some sort of communication. And then uh, it was revealed that Mike Flynn had been in contact with the Russian ambassador. Uh, and then once he became national security advisor, lied to the FBI. This is what these charges allege, and this is what uh, Mike Flynn will now uh, plea to. Uh, because on January 24th, just four days after the inauguration, he was interviewed by the FBI. According to our reporting, he was interviewed in the White House about this issue, these contacts with this Russian ambassador, and he lied, according to investigators. Uh, so he is a key witness in this. And, and keep in mind, Anne-Marie, there is also uh, what happened in February, these meetings between the president and James Comey, the former FBI director, where, uh, as Comey describes it, the president uh, asked Mr. Comey and the FBI to drop the Flynn investigation. The president called Flynn a, a good guy, something along uh, those words. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he is a key key witness uh, for investigators in this special counsel investigation. All right, that was uh, Homeland Security uh, correspondent Jeff Begay's talking. We want to turn your attention to two live shots out of Washington. On the left side of your screen is the federal courthouse where President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, will be pleading guilty, or he is pleading guilty right now, to a charge of making false statements to the FBI. On the right side of your screen is Capitol Hill, where the second-ranking Republican in the Senate says that they have the votes to pass the GOP tax bill ahead of a possible vote uh, today. But we want to begin with Michael Flynn, and uh, we want to bring in Ed O'Keefe. He's on the phone with us now. Um, Michael Flynn is the biggest uh, name charged at this point. Um, oh, actually, we have a little bit of video of Flynn entering the uh, courthouse. We're going to show you that. All right, you heard reporters yelling questions at him. Um, the plea agreement says that Flynn lied about his contacts with Russia's U.S. Uh, ambassador after the election. He lied to the FBI. It's a sign that Flynn is now cooperating with Robert Mueller's office. So CBS News political contributor and Washington Post reporter Ed O'Keefe joins me now on the phone. This is a really big deal, Ed O'Keefe. Uh, he is a big fish. He has been part of uh, the... Um, President Trump's inner circle for quite a long time until he was forced to resign in February. Um, this is the sort of news that uh, may be rocking the White House. 
Absolutely. No, I mean, it, it, you've not had anyone inside the White House who had been on the government payroll implicated in this entire affair so far until today. And the fact that he is pleading guilty to lying to the FBI on four separate occasions is a significant deal and, and one that certainly now puts this investigation right into the West Wing, where he was apparently interviewed when he lied to the FBI. Yeah. We've heard no official response from the White House. Lawmakers up here at the Capitol are starting to respond. Republicans mostly tight-lipped, saying, well, you know, the legal process is playing out. Democrats, obviously, uh, a little more publicly concerned about this. Dianne Feinstein, the senior senator from California and a top member of the Judiciary and Intelligence Panel, suggesting in a statement earlier that Flynn may have violated what's known as the Logan Act, which essentially forbids unauthorized Americans from doing business uh, on behalf of the United States with foreign powers. Uh, even if he is guilty of that, it won't matter at this point because he's essentially pleading guilty to a lesser charge, although certainly a serious charge of, pleading guilt, of, uh, of lying to the FBI. So, of course, this is an investigation into whether or not there was collusion or, or how the Russians um, meddled in the 2016 election. And we know that Michael Flynn spoke to Russian Ambassador uh, Sergei Kislyak about perhaps relaxing sanctions um, against Russia once Trump took office. He did this prior to Trump taking office. He did this in December. Um, but then he stayed on and became a part of the administration and the meetings that are at the center of this charge are meetings that occurred after he was part of the administration. That's, uh, that's correct. The, the ones and, that he lied and, about, that he's accused yeah. of lying about. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and just the mere fact that he lied to the FBI while serving as the White House National Security Advisor. Let that sink in. Somebody mm -hmm. who steps into the Oval Office every day to talk to the president about sensitive issues, lied to the FBI as part of a federal investigation. And in, in the words of, uh, of Senator uh, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, who just issued a statement here, I think he puts it pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, the special counsel has breached the White House gates, reaching one of the president's most trusted confidants and unmistakably implicating other top officials. The exact charge sends a bombshell signal it's about the Russians. Again, that from a statement by Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. Uh, I think that sort of gives you a sense of where certainly critics of this president uh, are today with this news yeah. that Flynn has pleaded guilty. And again, you know, it's not every day. Uh, it's not in every special counsel investigation that you see an administration official or a former administration official who had direct access to the president plead guilty to a crime. But that is what Flynn has done. Now, going forward, what does Flynn share with that investigative team? What else does he say? Who else does he finger uh, as, as culpable in all of this? That remains a big mystery and certainly something that is going to great, create a lot of consternation at the White House. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Michael Flynn has been in the crosshairs of this investigation for a while, though. Uh, we learned that uh, though his attorneys were cooperating with the White House attorneys, they stopped doing that. Um, where do we go from here? Who is of, who's sweating under their collar right now at O'Keefe? Well, I think it's, it's all the other folks who, who have been talked about. It's, it's the president's son, Donald Trump Jr. It's the president's son-in-law, Donald, or uh, Jared Kushner. It's, uh, you know, it, it's potentially uh, other administration officials, perhaps the attorney general, perhaps, uh, you know, others close to the president there in the building. We just uh, we don't entirely know at this point. Remember that the day that Paul Manafort and, and Rick Gates were indicted, later in the morning, we learned about another low-level campaign advisor, George Papadopoulos, who suddenly had pleaded guilty and was cooperating. Uh, it was that that led many to believe that this was going to head down past that were adverse to Mike Flynn and to others. And so undoubtedly there could be people now who see today's news and go, uh-oh, I'm next. Who they are exactly, we don't entirely know. Yeah, really. Um, let's move on to something else, because there is another sort of big deal happening here. It's, it's taxes in the there Senate. Is. And, uh, you know, it looked for a while there like that the Senate was not going to be able to push this tax bill along. But 
Things are moving at a, at a rapid pace, and at this point, uh, we're hearing word that the GOP does have the votes to pass this, and uh, it's heading to a full vote in the Senate. That's right. John Cornyn, who is the number two Senate Republican, the top vote counter for Republicans in the Senate, told reporters in the last hour that they now have the votes needed to advance the GOP tax reform plan that would allow the Senate to begin negotiations with the House on a final agreement. What that means is that he's got at least 50 votes. If it comes down to a 50-50 tie, where 48 members of the Democratic caucus are joined by Republicans Jeff Flake and Bob Corker in voting no, Vice President Mike Pence will be brought in to break the tie. We noticed this morning that there's no public events on the vice president's schedule, which means if he gets the call, he'll make his way up here to the Capitol and cast that tie-breaking vote. Now, you might be wondering, why are Jeff Flake and Bob Corker holdouts on a Republican plan? Well, they've been saying throughout this debate they're concerned about how much this could potentially add to the deficit. They were trying uh, up until yesterday afternoon to make some changes to this bill that would essentially put automatic triggers in place where tax certain taxes would go back up if economic growth wasn't keeping pace with what they had initially hoped in this bill. The problem is that that was creating some costs and other matters that were not seen as procedurally sound, so they were stripped out. And it looks like overnight here they haven't been able to cut an agreement, which is going to ice out potentially these two Republicans who are rather well-known, mm -hmm. who are retiring in part because they have significant disagreements and clashes with the president, and in essence now may see all of their juice, if you will, sucked away uh, and, and really make them uh, lame ducks, at least when it comes to tax policy. So we'll see. It's uh, Everything in this town today is pretty fluid, Anne-Marie, uh, but at this hour at least, Republicans have the votes they need to advance this bill. I want to talk a little bit uh, more about taxes, but I just want to let everybody know, at least uh, according to the news wires, former Trump National Security Advisor Michael Flynn has pleaded guilty to making false statements to the FBI about his contacts with a Russian diplomat. Uh, this is the first plea by any of the four former advisors to President Donald Trump. You may recall that uh, Paul Manafort, another uh, close advisor, has also been charged. Uh, he has not uh, plead, pled uh, guilty or had uh, any plea at all. In fact, he's trying to get out from under arrest, under, under, under house arrest, rather. Uh, but here we have it. The plea deal, the plea is in. It's a guilty plea. The deal that's associated with it, if there is a deal, has yet to be revealed. All right, just to pivot back to uh, taxes now, you mentioned uh, these deficit hawks that uh, still are uncomfortable with uh, the numbers that have been crunched. And the, the way the numbers look right now, the deficit would increase under this plan by a, a trillion dollars um, over the next 10 years. But there were other holdouts that obviously uh, came in line. Do we know what concessions were made in order to appeal to uh, some of the other holdouts, uh, the senators that were concerned about uh, pass-through businesses and taxes on businesses, the senators that were concerned about uh, the, in the inclusion of the individual mandate in this bill? We're still trying to figure that out, Anne-Marie, and, and, and frankly, it may just be that they've determined that in the negotiations that are inevitable between the House and the Senate, perhaps some of their concerns will be addressed. It may also be, frankly, that they've just decided, look, this is in the interest of the Republican Party to get this done, to demonstrate accomplishments this year. I don't want to stick it to the president and my party leadership. I'm going to go along to get along and realize that perfect is uh, not the enemy of the good, and, and it makes more sense to proceed. But uh, when it comes to those concerned about the deficit, we were led to believe from the start that they would take the pretty principled stance of saying, if this adds too much or to our liking, we will stand against it. And frankly, given that they are longtime, diehard fiscal conservatives who have made clear throughout their careers that they're concerned about deficit spending, it won't necessarily come as a surprise to their supporters. And in the case of Corker and Flake, again, who appear to be the holdouts, they're retiring anyway. All right, they, they have not nothing face to any lose. Real political consequences, exactly. Right, exactly. So there were tweaks made, but as it stands right now, the Senate version of the bill is quite different than the House's version of the bill. Absolutely. Uh, among other things, it makes uh, certain tax cuts permanent. Uh, there are differences when it comes to how much people could deduct from their property taxes, uh, which will be a big issue of concern to people in higher tax states like New York, New Jersey, California, or Illinois. Uh, there are some other differences regarding certain tax rules or rates 
uh, for multinational corporations who may have caught errors or things that they didn't like in the House version, went over to the Senate and said, could you please fix this? And we'll see if they survive the final compromise. Uh, you know, but one thing to keep in mind here, and Marie, as we move into the next few weeks and as we near Christmas, first off, there's another important debate going on. They've got to keep the government open mm -hmm. as of a week from today. So that may also complicate how quickly or how uh, productive Republicans are on the tax bill that they also have to divert some attention to keep the lights on. The other is, remember, that on Tuesday, December 12th, there is a special election for a Senate seat in Alabama. Yes. If Republicans have not voted on a final version of this bill by that date, and if the Democrat, Doug Jones, wins that seat, formerly held by Jeff Sessions, that too could complicate the vote count over here in the Senate. It may mean, ultimately, that as uh, an insurance policy, the House basically has to swallow hard and pass the Senate bill and let that be the final version of the tax legislation, which will upset a lot of House Republicans who don't like certain elements of the Senate plan. Uh, can, you know, Similarly, it may just be that Republicans find a way to keep hold of the Alabama Senate seat a few extra days if they need to and not seek the Democratic winner, which actually would be legal because Alabama law may take a few days to certify him as the winner. Now, if Roy Warren wins uh, and comes as a Republican member of the Senate, we don't know how he'd vote. Uh, but presumably, he would vote for this plan. He might need a few days to look at it. Uh, but it just shows you that so many other variables still hang out there. And uh, it's it's going to be a dramatic conclusion to December once we get uh, closer to Christmas, for sure. Definitely. I mean, passing this tax legislation is would be a big, big win for the president. He really needs it uh, moving into the new year. But uh, particularly if he passes the les legislation and Roy Moore wins in Alabama, this could almost sort of reverse the cloud that has been hanging over the administration all this time, the cloud that indicates they're, they just can't seem to get anything done. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, they're, they're very uh, eager to demonstrate that they're able to get something done. Uh, this is, you know, a bedrock principle of the Republican Party, that the tax code should be simpler and fairer and that Americans should be paying less in taxes. Uh, that remains up for debate, whether or not it really would end up that way for most Americans, certainly for some, but not for all. And, uh, you know, if anything, I think this is a reminder that the legislative process can be messy, can be dramatic, and uh, it ain't over until the president signs the document. Very true. He wants that on his desk uh, before Christmas time. We'll see if he gets his Christmas wish or not. Just uh, reminding everyone that the video that you're seeing right here, the shot that you're seeing right here is just outside the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. We are waiting for uh, um, uh, Michael Flynn to uh, come out. We received word that he uh, pled guilty to um, lying to the FBI. Uh, prosecutors say Flynn spoke with a senior official of Trump's transition team who was at Mar-a-Lago Resort in December of 2016 to discuss what what to communicate with Russian ambassador. Okay, so we're getting some interesting uh, information um, about this. So this is from uh, Newswire, so that's uh, just some information uh, not confirmed yet. But uh, the reason that this is such a huge story is because Michael Flynn has been a very close advisor to the president for quite a long time. He was a close advisor to the president. He was an instrumental uh, part of the campaign. He was the guy that you saw on stage uh, leading the chance, lock her up about uh, Hillary Clinton and so there's some irony in this uh, in that he's the one that's pleading guilty uh, in court today but he also out of the four aides who have been charged by the uh, in, by this uh, special counsel Mueller's investigation out of the four aides that have been charged he's the only one that also became a part of the administration he wasn't there for very long because he was forced to resign he resigned in February after it was disclosed that he lied to um, the vice president about his uh, meetings with Russian officials. The vice president uh, went on a national TV on the Sunday uh, political talk shows and uh, said that there was no interaction and then uh, afterwards learned that that wasn't the case and that's the reason why he was forced to resign. But even 
though he was forced to resign. The president remained uh, a, a supporter of Michael Flynn, calling him a good guy, uh, you know, tweeting out that he should ask for immunity because this is a witch hunt. And what we haven't heard yet is anything from the White House. Ed O'Keefe, uh, CBSN uh, contributor and also uh, from the Washington Post, you're, you've been on the phone with me. We haven't heard from the uh, White House thus far, but they've sort of crafted a narrative around Michael Flynn already, which is that if he did anything, it didn't happen while he was a part of the, the administration. And now we're learning that's not true. Yeah, and, and um, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, our, our, our guidance so far this morning is that the White House itself will not comment on this, that it will right. be up to the president's attorneys to say something, if anything. And, uh, you know, that, that, that harkens back to the way this was handled during the, the Clinton years when he was facing a similar investigation where the White House wouldn't formally comment, but the guy paid by the president to be his attorney would. Hmm. And so we'll just see whether or not, uh, so there's precedence for this, uh, we'll just see whether or not the president's attorney comes out and says anything in this regard. I, I think, if anything, the White House especially, and, and the president's legal team are at this point very concerned about the details of that plea deal. Will Flynn testify against the president and or his family members and or other administration officials? And what specifically is he prepared to share? Does he have documents? Does he recall certain moments? Does he have a list of the Russians he was in touch with who asked him to do that i think all of that at this point is probably what is most troubling and concerning to the white house and to the legal team to the white house obviously for the political ramifications and the legal ramifications and what it can do to stunt the administration's ambitions and obviously to the legal team because at what point if at all does it ever implicate the president directly and lead to far more serious situations you know what we know is that he's charged in connection with lying to the fbi um, but this is an investigation into whether or not there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians and how the Russians may have meddled in the 2016 election. Is it significant that what he's being charged with is an activity that occurred not during the campaign and actually does not have anything to do with meddling with the campaign and Russians at all, really? Well, it's significant in that once the special counsel launches their probe, as I understand it, they can investigate whatever they find. Mm. It's not just about one specific thing. So that is why, in this case, they're able to get Flynn online to the FBI, because he did do that, apparently. He's admitted to that now by pleading guilty. But they may have been investigating other things. And so by, by charging him with this general crime, of lying in the midst of an investigation, he may now be able to help them out with other aspects of whatever it is they're looking into. Mm -hmm. Remember, some of the charges related to Manafort, as I recall, had to do with his business dealings, which may or may not actually have direct uh, association with what he was doing on the Trump campaign itself. Again, special counsel may have found wrongdoing, figures, okay, well, we're going to take care of that as well. So... This is the, the tricky and stressful and consequential nature of special uh, prosecutor investigations, is that at this point, once they're in panels, once they're doing their job, they can go wherever they want. But remember, the Whitewater investigation of the Clinton years was about a land deal. It ended mm -hmm. up being about the president lying about an affair he had with an intern. I mean, that's, that, that's where you, know, you can draw the line from that to the other thing. Similarly here, it started in one place. It could go in all sorts of directions. That is very true. I just want to point out uh, something to you and uh, our viewers, Ed. Uh, you know, we've been watching the stock market really soar to uh, record highs. We talked about uh, breaking another record yesterday, and it's starting to tumble uh, upon hearing this news that Michael Flynn has uh, pled guilty to uh, lying to the FBI. It's down about uh, 270 points there for the day. Of course, you know, the, the uh, stock market does go up and down, but this is uh, perhaps a significant indication that um, business is feeling a little uneasy about this latest development, Ed. Yeah, and, and remember, they were doing pretty well this week on anticipation of the Senate passing the tax plan, mm -hmm. believing that that was going to lead to a, a more favorable environment for uh, for stockholders, certainly, and for the corporations they're buying into. But, uh, you know, we, we know the stock market does uh, ebb and flow sometimes related to political developments, and yeah. certainly this is a significant one. So perhaps 
two hours into the trading day, it's, not, it's no surprise that there's at least a little bit of a, of a pullback. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mentioned that there are four aides in total that have been charged. Uh, Michael Flynn uh, looks like the, the only one that has managed to uh, hammer out a deal. Um, but we, you touched on Paul Manafort. His charges are related to, like you said, his businesses, uh, possible money laundering and fraud. Um, but how could he have an impact on this investigation and the White House? What would he know? Uh, well, let's remember, he, he was a, a campaign advisor, he was involved in transition planning, and he was the national security advisor himself. He's had security clearance since the Obama years, and therefore could have seen and touched just about anything mm -hmm. that was uh, sensitive in nature to the, you know, to the United States in general. He, <laughs> he could have uh, obtained other information uh, that would have been favorable to his own future business prospects. He could have been uh, reviewing things that uh, might have tipped off the administration in one way or another. And uh, so, you know, one should presume, if you're a national security advisor, that you can basically see and touch everything. Yeah. And uh, outside of, uh, you know, basic political matters of the president might have the privilege of getting in there for just about any kind of meeting. So getting him to plead guilty and to cooperate, uh, this is about as as, as, as good a, a win for Mueller and his investigative team as they can hope for, because this is somebody who was literally in the room during the campaign, during the transition, and during the early days of the administration. Mm -hmm. um, is this an indication, and now that you know, it certainly appears as if Michael Flynn has uh, hammered out a deal with the investigators, does this sort of weaken uh, any case that Paul Manafort might have or sort of diminish his value? No idea. Hmm. Uh, I'm not. You and I aren't privy to the legal details here, but uh, but uh, it, it could potentially because Flynn may end up fingering Manafort in certain situations. He may uh, suggest that Manafort didn't tell investigators everything, but we have no way of knowing that. All right. So we are getting a statement from Michael Flynn that I'm going to read right off the computer, and I'm reading it cold. This is what it says. After 33 years of military service to our country, including nearly five years in combat away from my family, and then my decision to continue to serve the United States, it has been extraordinarily painful to endure these many months of false accusations of treason and other outrageous acts. Such false accusations are contrary to everything I have ever done and stood for, but I recognize that the actions I acknowledged in court today were wrong. And though my faith in God, and rather through my faith in God, I am working to set things right. My guilty plea and agreement to cooperate with the special counsel's office reflect a decision I made in the best interests of my family and of our country. I accept full responsibility for my actions. So there you have it, the first bit of uh, news that we're getting directly from Michael Flynn and uh, the first acknowledgement that he is in fact cooperating with the special counsel's office. What do you make of that statement, Ed? I, you know, I, he lays it out for us. Uh, and he he uh, obviously uh, realizes what's before him now, and I think at this point, uh, it's less about what he says in his public statements and more about what he tells prosecutors as they continue this investigation. Yeah, what does he know, and uh, and who will he be talking about? We're going to take a quick break. Uh, Michael Flynn, a former uh, advisor to the president, has pled guilty to lying to the FBI and has acknowledged that he is cooperating with special counsel Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN.
Welcome back, everyone. You're looking at a shot uh, just outside of a federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. The media is waiting for Michael Flynn to emerge. Uh, he went into that courthouse not too long ago, and now we know that he has uh, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI about contacts that he had with Russian officials. He also, just a very short time ago, released a statement, and it reads, After over 33 years of military service to our country, including nearly five years in combat, away from my family and then my decision to continue to serve the United States, it has been extraordinarily painful to endure these many months of false accusations and treason and other outrageous acts. Such false accusations are contrary to everything I have ever done and stood for. But I recognize that the actions I acknowledged in court today were wrong and through my faith in God, I am working to set things right. My guilty plea and agreement to cooperate with the special counsel's office reflect a decision I made in the best interests of my family and of our country. I accept full responsibility for my actions. And of course, it's dated today, December 1st, 2017. So that is what we're hearing from Michael Flynn. Uh, CBSN political contributor Caitlin Huey Burns is uh, joining me on the phone. So, Caitlin, it has been quite a morning. Uh, Michael Flynn, a very significant individual in uh, the Trump campaign and also in the Trump administration, even though he wasn't there very long. He was only there until February. Um, he knows a lot about the interactions that many members of the campaign and the administration had with all sorts of people, including including uh, Russian officials. Good morning, Emory. That's morning. certainly right. What really uh, stuck out to me in the beginning when we heard this news this morning was the date on that court document that said that uh, Michael Flynn had lied to the FBI on or around January 24th, which of course was uh, officially during the administration of the Trump presidency, of course, the inauguration being on January 20th. Um, you bring up a really excellent point and something that I've been wondering myself is, you know, what happens from here as far as we know Michael Flynn is cooperating now uh, with this special counsel? Um, what kinds of conversations was he having during the transition period and, of course, during his time um, as, uh, as head of NSA? Uh, I think those are questions that a lot of people are wondering uh, in the White House. And while the White House is going to try to distance itself from this in many ways, it's very, very difficult for them to do so. Remember the previous guilty plea that we saw from George Papadopoulos, the White House had argued that he played a very minor role in the campaign. They called him a coffee boy. Hmm. As it pertains to Michael Flynn, of course, we know that you cannot possibly make that argument for him because he was NSA and because he was a key player in uh, the Trump campaign. So we have another statement. This one is uh, from the president's attorney, Ty Cobb, today. Michael Flynn, a former national security advisor at the White House for 25 days during the Trump administration and a former Obama administration official entered a guilty plea to a single count of making a false statement to the FBI. The false statements involved Rather, the false statements involved mirror the false statements to White House officials, which resulted in his resignation in February of this year. Nothing about the guilty plea or the charge implicates anyone other than Mr. Flynn. The conclusion of this phase of the special counsel's work demonstrates again that the special counsel is moving with all deliberate speed and clears the way for a prompt and reasonable conclusion. So that's very interesting. Now we're hearing, uh, we're not going to hear from the White House, but we're hearing from the president's own mm -hmm. attorney. And um, basically they're saying nothing to see here. This is nothing new. Um, you know, we fired him after we found out that he had lied to the vice president. And this is basically the same ground being covered. Right. They're certainly trying to thread the argument here that, uh, look, Mike Flynn lied to us and we fired him for it. Uh, but we know that there are some holes in that argument. For example, the president continued to uh, praise Michael Flynn even after he had fired him. He said uh, in a range of different kinds of interviews, uh, talked very highly of Michael Flynn and said that, you know, he was worried uh, about him in terms of the legal um, hurdles that he was facing. Uh, we also know from the New York Times report, uh, you know, tying this back to, to James Comey when, uh, you know, according to uh, memos that, that Comey had kept, um, uh, the president had, you know, 
tried to to get him to let this investigation into Flynn go. Mm -hmm. And so while the White House is trying to uh, make themselves look pretty in the clear here, um, just given the statements that we had seen from Donald Trump uh, afterwards, um, poke some holes in that. And also, uh, remember, when, when Donald Trump was interviewed about Michael Flynn, it, you know, it's not surprising that he's going to try to blame the Obama administration for uh, Michael Cl- uh, Flynn's clearance. But yeah. it's also important to note that the Obama administration had warned uh, the president, the now president, about Michael Flynn. Remember, Sally Yates, acting attorney general, had sent uh, warnings about Michael Flynn to the administration, and she was fired before Michael Flynn was. Yeah, and I find it interesting in that statement, too, there's no mention of the role that um, Michael Flynn played during the campaign. I mean, after all, this is an investigation into Russian collusion in the election, uh, prior to the election, the, uh, rather prior to uh, the Trump right. uh, Trump t- taking office. And there's no mention of that at all. And what it's it reminds me of is um, the way the, uh, the administration reacted to the news that Paul Manafort um, was being charged, uh, diminishing him down to being nothing but a volunteer uh, on the campaign mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, a campaign chairman. And you mentioned George Papadopoulos, uh, you know, suggesting that he had a very, very minor role, even though, you know, it appears as if he did. He was in that meeting uh, with Donald Trump in which he raised the idea mm-hmm. of making a, a connection with Russian officials. Um, so this seems to sort of be the the pattern here is to mm-hmm. diminish the role in which these individuals played in the campaign and in this case also in the administration. Right, exactly. And if you look at how Donald Trump has talked about this investigation, and particularly when uh, the conversation was surrounding James Comey, uh, Donald Trump has been trying to, um, has has really been thinking about his own involvement, right? Um, Saying, you know, Comey suggested that I wasn't under investigation and that sort of thing. So his interest in this case has always really been about his personal involvement. So the White House is trying to kind of stick to that and say that this doesn't personally involve Donald Trump. But you really can't get a more senior uh, person involved in the administration. Uh, Caitlin, I'm going to stop you right now for a second. Uh, Michael Flynn is leaving the courthouse. So there you go. Michael Flynn has uh, left the federal courthouse after pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. You heard the chance of lock lock him up and you saw uh, the signs there. You know, that's in reference to um, Michael Flynn during the campaign, really, you know, leading the chant of lock her up. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, on stage, there's a lot of a lot of video of that. And uh, there's a certain irony in this in that uh, after encouraging, um, you know, the crowd to sort of respond to that locking up uh, Hillary Clinton. He is the one that's pleading guilty here to lying to the FBI, Caitlin. Right, exactly. And I think we're really interested to see first uh, what what are the arrangements of this plea deal and what uh, that plea exactly looks like? Um, you know, what kind of conversations was he having with the president during the transition and during uh, his tenure as president? Um, I, you know, there are going to be a lot of questions about what uh, Michael Flynn and Trump have talked about. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the White House is trying to say that they are kind of in the free and clear here, and they may, they, that may be true. However, you know, the political implications of this, of course, go without saying, are profound uh, for this president. Just look at the backdrop, for example, of today, which I think really perfectly encapsulates everything we've seen in this in this tumultuous year. Uh, the Republican Congress is about to, is poised, really, to pass a major tax reform bill through the Senate. This would be a significant accomplishment for this president. However, the news of the day surrounds uh, his former NSA, Michael Flynn, plead, uh, who has uh, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI while he was uh, at NSA. 
That is, so, that, is, uh, that is so true. I mean, this should be a, a time when the administration is celebrating a tax reform is not easy. And there was a mm -hmm. lot of speculation that they would not even be able to get it out of the committee, much less to get to a, a, a vote uh, in the Senate. And it looks like they're going to do it. And at least and it looks like they have the votes. And you're right. We're not talking about that. Uh, Zeke Miller from the Associated Press, you are on the phone with me right now. Is it significant, Zeke, that he... He is pleading guilty to lying to the FBI um, while he was a part of the administration. That is, lying to the FBI um, when, not during the campaign, and this is an investigation, the Mueller investigation is into, is looking at Russian meddling in the campaign, whether or not there was collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. And these charges have nothing to do with that. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really important point here. That what Flynn is uh, uh, it, it just pled guilty to um, was uh, that he lied to the FBI while serving in the Trump administration as the national security advisor. His interview with the FBI was while he was in the White House. Uh, and uh, that, that's uh, that, that's uh, a, a really striking and sort of at, their, at bare minimum a, pol a political scandal for this administration. Um, and you know, sort of we're 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 we're, we're in in a time frame where it's easy to get sometimes overlook. Um, and, and sort of get, get desensitized to sort of a development of this magnitude. But this is the former national security advisor to a president of the United States um, pleading guilty to crimes he committed while in that office. Um, but, you know, you're right. This also doesn't necessarily, this is not uh, him you know, anything to do with collusion. I mean, Flynn's statement, he put out saying, you know, he was, you know, sort of resented any implication that he'd uh, been involved in any sort of treason or acts against the United States. He said in, his, in court that he was acting at, at the direction of members of the Trump uh, transition, uh, the officials in the Trump transition when he communicated uh, with the Russian government here. Um, so there's, there's certainly a lot of exposure for um, for the Trump White House here, but uh, this isn't as bad as it could have been, but also certainly is not what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, stand by for Zeke, Caitlin, uh, Paula, Paula Reed, uh, CBS News uh, Justice uh, Correspondent, Justice Department Correspondent, you are standing by. You were outside the, the courthouse. Uh, do we know anything about what happened inside that courthouse? Yeah, well, so you went in, and wait, I was not physically in the courtroom, mm -hmm. but some of our producers were. He went in, and he pled guilty to these charges. And we also know that we've received a statement from Mike Flynn where he says that he has decided to enter this plea deal and cooperate with special counsel because it is in the best interest of his family. That sounds pretty good. And so where do we go from here? What is the next step in this process? Well, the big question is what kind of evidence is he providing the special counsel? It has to be something significant to get the special counsel to over overlook a lot of these charges. But that will be the big question that a lot of people will have. How, to what extent is he cooperating? What is he providing Mueller with? And, of course, if the president believes that this could harm him or his family, there could be some blowback. Uh, indeed. Um, we know that uh, the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was called in for questioning, and the focus, many of the questions were focused on uh, Michael Flynn. Um, this is a significant accomplishment, if you will, for the Mueller investigation to have Michael Flynn cooperate. He knows a lot about a lot of stuff. He would have been there at the outset when all of the discussions for the administration were going on. He, he, he only he knows who, why he met with the Russian ambassador. Was that at the direction of campaign oh, officials? Yeah. Was that something he did of his own volition? These are all the kinds of things that Robert Mueller is going to be interested in, and Mike Flynn has, has answers for him. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, Caitlin, um, you uh, have been listening to all of this. Um, what about that? What about the fact that he's pleading guilty to lying to the FBI? He's not pleading guilty to anything associated with the campaign. And this is really the focus of this investigation is whether or not there was collusion, whether or not he operated uh, if there was collusion, whether or not, uh, you know, he made contacts with Russian officials at the behest of uh, of uh, Donald Trump or his close advisors. I mean, this mm -hmm. line to the FBI has nothing to do with that. Right. And I think that is really important to point out that this charge and uh, also this guilty plea, I should say, and also the guilty plea of George Papadopoulos, which we saw a couple months ago, was also related to uh, lying to the FBI. Now, uh, the White House and supporters of the president are arguing that um, given that this is a different kind of, of, of uh, guilty plea, right, it's not pleading guilty to collusion, it's 
pleading guilty to uh, lying to the FBI. Um, other, you know, analysts and experts would say that, you know, proving collusion, um, it, it, you know, collusion isn't necessarily, um, that there are different ways to, to show it, right? And so the big question is, um, again, what kinds of conversations uh, Flynn is now having with the Mueller investigation. Um, I think that could be very revealing, potentially, if there's anything there. And if not, I mean, if there isn't anything to come from this, you know, that that is also significant. But I think uh, we have already seen, you know, two or three big bombshells in this investigation. And a lot of people, I think, would point to this as just the beginning of this, counter to what uh, the White House lawyers are saying, that they're hoping that this, they think that this will be wrapped up by the end of the year. Uh, some could argue that today's news shows that this uh, could be, you know, much more far-ranging and into the future and, of course, into a new uh, legislative year and an election year. Yeah, definitely. This may be an, a whole other phase to this investigation. Uh, Zika, you know, you heard the statement from Ty Cobb, the uh, president's uh, attorney, um, basically sort of underscoring that uh, Michael Flynn was uh, only working uh, for the White House for 25 days and then he was fired and he was fired for lying about his contacts with uh, Russian officials and so he's pleading guilty to lying about his contacts with Russian officials uh, sort of playing down not only his role in the administration but also the significance of this disclosure that that and the, that he lied to the White House or he lied to the vice president and uh, they made quick work of him at that point as well. Yeah, I mean that's uh, you know, we can call that a selective uh, reading of history. Uh, you know, there's also the the, 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 the sort of statement asserts that uh, he was a former Obama administration official, noting that he was at DIA uh, in the Obama administration. He was sort of pushed out of that role in the Obama administration, but uh, it really does gloss over the fact that Michael Flynn was at President Donald Trump's side all throughout the uh, the 2016. Uh, year uh, through the transition, uh, through the presidential debates at the convention, as a surrogate, as an advisor. Um, he was with the president in close contact with him um, all the way through that period. Um, that's number, the first thing it, uh, that, that statement overlooks. The second thing is that uh, you know, the president, uh, you know, is, is that Flynn says in court that uh, he was directed to have those conversations with Russian officials. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that the president has denied. So now the question is, whom had that? Who you know? Who who gave him that directive? Right. Um, and 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 is there is there more to drop there? So it's certainly that that's the White House is, is ignoring that part of the statement. There's certainly some big questions that still need to be answered. So Caitlin, when you hear that that he says that he was directed to make contact, um, you know, who do you think is the most nervous right now upon hearing this news? There's no way that the White House of the president can't be nervous about this. We know that the president has been uh, really frustrated by the scope and mandate of this investigation in the first place of the investigations going on in Congress. We saw reporting from the New York Times this morning showing that uh, the president has been uh, pressuring or asking um, investigators on Capitol Hill to kind of wrap this all up. Uh, he he is very uh, has been very conscious of this. This has been kind of at the core of his uh, frustrations. And we've seen uh, over the course of the past several months um, the, the president try to uh, call this a witch hunt, uh, call this um, something, you know, contrived by Democrats to explain losing the election and that sort of thing. So um, it, there is there is no way to to for uh, the, the president not to feel um, a lot of pressure here, given that um, his former national security advisor, someone very close to him, not only lied to the FBI, but is now cooperating with the special counsel and uh, could possibly talk about possible conversations. Again, we don't know exactly what those conversations were, uh, but judging by the testimony today, the president, according to Flynn, directing him uh, to, uh, with those Russia conversations, I think um, the question is what more is there to come and what kind of consequences are there. And that statement by Ty Cobb mentions that Flynn was a part of the Obama administration as well. Let's sort of take us back in time uh, because President Obama warned Donald Trump about including him in his administration, about hiring him. Can we talk a little bit about the role he played in the Obama administration and why he was of concern to President Obama? 
Right. Uh, the president had warned the campaign not to hire this guy. I think it's also, um, it, it, we have to also look at the warnings from Sally Yates, acting attorney general, uh, who was then later fired. Uh, her, she also uh, sent warnings to him. Um, I'm recalling an interview that President Trump did with NBC's Lester Holt, in which he was um, kind of already putting blame on the Obama administration for um, giving Michael Flynn high security clearance. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to hear um, a lot of, of Donald Trump's supporters, and you're already hearing this, of course, in that statement from Ty Cobb, um, that the Obama administration shares some of the blame. I think it's, again, really important to look at uh, the role in which uh, Michael Flynn played in the, admini- in the administration as a, uh, in the Trump administration, and uh, the crime he has committed uh, in terms of lying to the FBI took place while he was um, at the, at the, uh, as a uh, national security advisor to the president. Yeah, and Zeke, you know, he could have faced a number of different charges. Um, he has <laughs> taken, there, there's some work that he did. He's taken money uh, for from the Turkish government. And there are a number of different ways in which he really sort of has violated the law. Um, but he's only been charged with lying to the FBI. But what other charges could he have faced? Well, we know, for instance, that Michael Flynn did not file, because uh, it was not truthful when he filed his uh SF-86 has formed to renew his security clearance um, when it was uh, reissued uh, in 2016. Um, so uh, that is a is a federal offense. Uh, not doing that. I mean, it's one of those. It's, it's not often prosecuted. Uh, there are uh, emendations that are amendments usually made to them. Which in the case that Jared Kushner had that issue, where he had to go back and and and, and fill things in. Also, he didn't file as a as a as a registered foreign agent for work on uh, on behalf of the Turkish government. Um, all of those are things that, that could have been uh, uh, that, that could have prosecutors could have brought charges on. Here, he's pleading out to essentially a it's a serious charge, but uh, sort of a lesser less serious charge, and one also that keeps the focus on Russia and on the White House. And that's a uh, but both uh, interesting uh, you know tidbits. I mean, that, that Mueller could have gotten a tra- him to plead, plead out on any of those charges, but he wanted this one. Uh, he wanted to get him on line to the FBI about these conversations. Right. Uh, so there is another big story happening today. It's the uh, tax reform bill that has been making its way uh, through the Senate. And we're hearing now from Mitch McConnell that uh, he says they do have the votes, which means that uh, this bill should be heading to the floor of the Senate for a Senate-wide vote. Uh, probably today. It's one of the things that they hope that they would get done by the end of the week. It is the end of the week. It's Friday, and it looks like it'll get done. Uh, uh, Zeke, can we talk a little bit about this uh, tax bill? It was, uh, you, you know, at least earlier in the week, there were a number of different senators that were pretty uneasy about it. I think sort of um, most importantly, uh, the senators who are sort of known as being uh, deficit hawks, this bill, uh, it looks like over a decade, will probably add a trillion dollars to the deficit. And uh, two of the deficit hawks, Bob Corker and Jeff Flake, they're not running again. So they have nothing to lose by not voting for this. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is you know, very different from you know, where, where we were a few months ago in health care, where it's been the moderates. Um, and then, and then John McCain seeking that legislation. They were the, they were the ones on the bubble. Here, are the mo- the moderate Republican senators are the ones on board, and the uh, it's the deficit hawks that are, uh, are are causing the most angst for uh, for Senate Republicans right now. That said, the leadership on on the Capitol Hill you know, says they have 50 votes. John Cornyn came out earlier today and said they have 50, which is what they need to pass it. But they're going for 52. They want to get uh, to show that they can get uh, you know unanimity uh, among Senate Republicans. But also, you know, there, there's, there's almost certainly going to be another turn to this when uh, if there's going to be a conference committee, they're going to have to get it back through the Senate. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, that's just you know, yet another opportunity for uh, all of these lawmakers who maybe some of them are even on board right now could then could, could drop off uh, down the line. So it's not done yet, but certainly uh, a, a, a victory looks like coming for Republicans. Yeah, uh, Caitlin Huey Burns, you're still there here with me, right? So I'm going to ask you a little <laughs> bit about, uh, you know, this tax legislation. Uh, there were other concerns, uh, concerns about uh, the, the pass-through businesses, um, concerns mm-hmm. about the individual mandate, which is um, the removal of the individual mandate in the health care in the ACA is present here in the Senate bill. It's not in the House's version of this bill. In fact, there are a lot of significant differences between the House version and the Senate version. Uh, the various mm-hmm. uh, tax brackets as, as well. Um, so getting over this hump and getting this vote done here in the Senate is certainly significant, 
But how big is the hurdle uh, to get the House version of the bill and the Senate version of the bill whittled down into one bill that can get onto the president's desk? Yeah, that's an important point here, that there are various phases of passing legislation, and these two versions will have to be reconciled. I will say, though, that um, just, you know, having covered the pa- the, the unsuccessful uh, way in which they approached the health care bill and looking at how senators are approaching uh, this uh, tax bill, uh, there is a very different kind of tone here. Uh, you have had senators looking for ways to get to a yes vote. Uh, you saw that also on the rep- on the House side, although you did have a number of significant Republican defections on that bill because of um, some, some tax issues as it pertained to some Republicans in their states like New York and New Jersey and some in California. Um, so these will have to be reconciled. I think another kind of uh, thread that I've been trying to follow is the political Political one. Yes, certainly you have uh, this uh, notion that Republicans are feeling a need to have something to show for their majorities in Congress. And I think that uh, imperative becomes even more so now that we have um, this Flynn indictment. Uh, you will have Democrats saying, um, how can Republicans support an agenda item uh, of the president while his uh, former national security advisor ha- is pleading guilty to lying to the FBI? I would argue that Republicans... Um, want to be able to show that they have uh, have been able to do something in Congress. Otherwise, um, their their lack of, of legislation, the controversy surrounding the White House with a Republican in charge, uh, I think becomes overbearing and harder for them to make the case uh, in November. So. Um, the, the tax bill, if it does pass and gets to the president's desk, this is a, a major accomplishment for Republicans. Remember, taxes are something that they've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, whether this will be a political boon or a liability for them, I think, remains to be seen. We'll see what the economy looks like in November, for example. You know, this is something that we were talking about the other day. It looks like um, that this bill, at least the Senate's version of the bill, is going to add a trillion dollars to the deficit. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the GOP party has always been the party of fiscal conservatism. and But it certainly doesn't seem to be that way at all. In fact, the only kind of holdouts that the deficit hawks are, are senators who are running again anyway. So it really doesn't matter mm-hmm. if they vote or, or against or don't vote for this, um, this bill. My how things have changed. Is this, is this no longer the party of fiscal conservatism? You know, it is a very interesting about face, uh, a party that talked a lot about the deficit during the Obama administration. And here uh, you have CBO reports saying that it would add over a trillion dollars to uh, the deficit. I think that is very significant. Um, I think it also kind of points to how um, eager Republicans are to for some kind of legislative victory, particularly on taxes. They want to be able to go to their constituents and say, not only have we um, actually done something uh, here in our year in charge of of all of Washington, but uh, we have cut taxes for you, never mind um, the financial burdens that could come later. Remember, in addition to adding to the deficit by a trillion dollars, the CBO also estimates that um, by the year 2027, uh, low-income individuals will see their taxes be um, increased again because these tax cuts are temporary. You also hear from Democrats uh, a big concern about keeping the corporate tax cut, which is a huge cut in this legislation, keeping that permanent. And so you're going to have a lot of people wondering uh, why corporations are getting breaks. Of course, Republicans arguing that that money will be, um, you know, cycled back into the economy. And there is, a, a, you know, that is been their sticking point uh, or been their argument, but it's also certainly a sticking point for Democrats. So um, I think you're going to see a lot of messaging around this bill, but again, uh, it will we'll wait and see kind of how voters and Americans are processing it. Indeed. So we're getting a little more information, and I apologize, but there's two big stories and we're trying to bounce back and forth between the two of them. So we're getting a little more information about uh, Michael Flynn here. Um, this is coming from Jeff Begay's, our Homeland Security um, correspondent, and I'm going to read his uh, email. CBS News has confirmed that U.S. law enforcement officials have long suspected that Michael Flynn did not engage the Russian ambassador without being directed to do so. Soon after, electronic intercepts picked up the conversations between Sergei Kislyak and Flynn. U.S. officials began to suspect that someone encouraged him to do it. 
The lack of a Russian response to the sanctions imposed by the Obama administration stunned intelligence officials working in the Obama administration. In an interview earlier this year, former uh, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper told CBS that uh, the reaction was very un-Russian-like and very curious. So today's plea agreement with Flynn suggests that the special counsel's office views the conversation with Kislyak as an, as an important or perhaps even a critical aspect of the overall investigation as prosecutors try to determine who else, who else uh, in the uh, Trump administration or up the Trump transition chain of command was aware of the conversations. And we know uh, through intercepts that Michael Flynn discussed with Sergei Kislyak the easing of sanctions um, against uh, Russia should Trump win the election. So, um, Caitlin, uh, you heard this statement, and I also um, want to bring in Zeke Miller and Zeke get your uh, reaction to this, but this is sort of a confirmation uh, that, um, that investigators have felt for a long time that someone instructed uh, Michael Flynn to make contact with Sergei Kislyak and to have these conversations. Before I uh, jump over to you, Caitlin, just going to point out a tweet by uh, James Comey. You may remember former FBI Director James Comey, who was forced out of that position, uh, tweeted just six minutes ago, a quote, but justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Some pretty powerful uh, words right there. Uh, a little window into how he's feeling right now as he sees uh, Michael Flynn plead guilty. Um, so what do you make of uh, what the sort of new reporting that we're getting from uh, Jeff Piquet's that, uh, that officials have long suspected that someone told Michael Flynn to make, the, make these contacts and who that person might be? Yeah, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago in relation to what the actual guilty plea today was, which is lying to the FBI and noting that that is not a guilty plea to um, collusion. Now, this re new reporting is significant because it kind of shows where Mueller's investigation is winding here and why um, these charges, uh, this, this guilty plea from Flynn, uh, is so important because of uh, now this cooperation can perhaps illuminate on uh, these conversations and, uh, again, just shows the uh, wide scope that this investigation, this probe, has and why the White House has to certainly uh, be worried about it uh, politically uh, in, in the least. Certainly, uh, Zeke Miller, it certainly looks like this investigation is inching closer and closer to Donald Trump's uh, inner circle. That's uh, absolutely right. Somebody told... Uh uh, at least according, according to prosecutors and Flynn himself, somebody told him to uh, have these conversations with the Russian ambassador. Who was that? Uh, was it Jared Kushner? Was it Don Jr.? Was it the president himself, the vice president? The president has denied, uh, back in a press conference earlier, but he denied being the person instructing Flynn to have those conversations. Um, is, you know, will Flynn contradict him? Uh, will he point to fingers at others in the, in, inside the White House? Those are all open questions here. Uh, that said, even if it does come out that way, you know, this is not necessarily um, a criminal issue for the White House. It certainly could be a, a public relations issue for them at night, not, not, or, or people in, in, in the president's orbit. Uh, but it is just yet one more thread for the special counsel to pull and see where that leads. And this is all obviously only one, um, just one uh, lane of this investigation, which, you know, also is dealing with uh, Paul Manafort's business contacts from years ago. So we don't know what else he, uh, 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 Mueller has on any of these players, uh, but certainly this does move the investigation, the target of the investigation, a bit closer, and we know that people closer to the president um, are potentially implicated in this. Right, and, you know, of course, this is one investigation that's taking place, but there are congressional investigations as well. Uh, do we expect, well, I, I expect that uh, Congress is watching this very, very closely, and some of those uh, people uh, investigating whether or not or how the Russians uh, meddled in the 2016 election perhaps will be interested in this plea deal as well. Zeke. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, the, the, the congressional committees have, uh, have tried to give wide latitude to the special counsel. They try to deconflict their investigations, uh, but certainly they're 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 watching this closely. Um, and uh, and you know, sort of certainly uh, anyone uh, anyone inside the administration who, who uh, or, or in the Trump orbit who did anything wrong in 2016 
Uh, they're, they, they're, they're looking over their shoulders. What does, what does Flynn know about, about them? What conversations did they have? Um, and those are all the things that they're trying to, you know, going over the, with their attorneys, presumably right now, to figure out what is their exposure now that uh, Michael Flynn has apparently turned state's evidence. Yeah. Now, the sort of punishment that he is um, facing is sort of up for grabs. I'm taking a quick look at the plea agreement. It certainly seems to be a fine, and I'll sort of make my way through these documents and see if I can find out what uh, what um, sort of punishment he may be facing. But certainly it seems like he's cooperating and... Uh, you know, he's the fourth uh, aide to the president to be charged here. Uh, Paul Manafort, the former campaign chairman, would have been sort of the next person who is uh, higher up uh, in the, uh, or sort of the, the closer to um, the president. And it certainly doesn't look like Paul Manafort was able to uh, hammer out a deal or didn't, didn't cooperate. And I'm sure uh, that puts him in a more vulnerable position than he was uh, just a, a day ago, uh, Caitlin. We know that Paul Manafort is under house arrest and he's been trying to negotiate, trying to put up uh, a few of his houses to get out from under house arrest. But uh, I presume, well, I guess we don't know what everyone knows, but uh, his, uh, his value may be diminished somewhat now that um, Michael Flynn is pleading guilty because uh, certainly Michael Flynn being involved in not only the campaign but also for a short period of time in the administration would know a whole lot about what went down. Uh, should Paul Manafort be worried? Right, and, and Paul Manafort was indicted on a uh, host of, of charges, um, and particularly pertaining to his involvement in, as a as a lobbyist for a foreign agent. Um, what's really interesting to me about the Flynn uh, guilty plea is uh, what he hasn't been charged for um, mm -hmm. and uh, the way in which, um, you know, this guilty plea suggests that uh, that the, the Mueller probe is very interested in the conversations and uh, that, that he was having with the president in the conversations regarding uh, Russia and those meetings. Um, I, I think that kind of speaks volumes about this, that they were willing to uh, perhaps overlook uh, some of those other uh, more egregious um, uh, charges uh, that could have been that could have come down that we were speaking about uh, several minutes ago to really focus in on this element. Um, I think that's pretty significant here. Yeah, um, just reading the indictment right here, and I'm just going to read it directly from here. Um, to get a sense of uh, why he pled guilty uh, on, uh, on or about January 24, 2016, Flynn agreed to be interviewed by agents of the FBI. During the interview, Flynn falsely stated that he did not ask Russia's ambassador to the United States to refrain from escalating the situation in response to sanctions that the United States had imposed against Russia. Flynn also falsely stated that he did not remember a follow-up conversation in which the Russian ambassador stated that Russia had chosen to moderate its moderate rather its response to those sanctions as a result of Flynn's request in truth and in fact however Flynn then and there knew the following had occurred um, you know this is about sanctions on Russia and uh, I, I think back to that meeting with uh, President Trump's son Donald Jr. and the um, and the Russian lawyer and these the pretext initially was that uh, it was a meeting about um, Russian adoption. Of course, that Russian adoption is associated with sanctions. Uh, the Russian adoption issue was uh, Russia's reaction to increase sanctions against it. And you know, it's the same topic coming up uh, once more. This issue of lifting the lifting of the sanctions. And if President Trump or if Donald Trump was to win the election. Election, would he be willing to ease the sanctions on Russia? This is very interesting stuff, Zeke. I don't know. Zeke, can you hear me? We lost Zeke. All right, but Caitlin is with us. So here this comes up uh, once again, uh, this issue of the sanctions against Russia. Caitlin. That's right. Um, and these conversations that um, that the that Michael Flynn was having. Remember, um, just go back to um, relating this back to the vice president and, and why Michael Flynn 
was fired, uh, the White House's explanation for why Michael Flynn was fired, um, the vice president was asked uh, if Michael Flynn or anybody else had discussed Russia sanctions. And uh, the vice president said no. It turned out later that um, Michael Flynn had not been forthcoming about those conversations and uh, had, had lied to the vice president. And um, that kind of uh, started this, this um, these series of events. Um, I, I do think that, you know, kind of taking all of this in the aggregate is, is what the special counsel is trying to do here, um, trying to put all these threads together. Um, you've had uh, two congressional committees, of course, looking into this. Uh, I should say four, uh, two on the House side, two on the, the, the Senate side, um, two uh, intelligence committees in the House and Senate uh, are key to this. Um, and you've also had the special counsel probe. I'm also curious to see, you know, over the next couple of days, whether and how the president himself reacts, whether it's on Twitter or elsewhere. He's been quiet. There is no uh, public schedule for him uh, at this point today. Um, We also know that the Mueller probe is ongoing. There is no um, end date. There are no parameters. Caitlin, I'm going to cut into you. We're going to throw this to a CBS News special report. Michael Flynn pleading guilty to lying to the FBI. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Anthony Mason reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good morning. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty today to lying to the FBI about his contacts with Russia. He entered the plea in federal court in Washington. Then in a written statement, Flynn said he is cooperating with special counsel Robert Mueller. Mueller is investigating Russian interference in the U.S. election last year and whether anyone in the Trump campaign was was involved. Flynn was a foreign policy advisor to the campaign and later President Trump's first national security advisor. Mr. Trump fired Flynn for lying to Vice President Pence about his contacts with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. In his statement, Flynn said it has been extraordinarily painful to endure these many months of false accusations of treason. But he said the actions I acknowledged in court today were wrong and I am working to set things right. Flynn said my guilty plea and agreement to cooperate with the special counsel's office reflect a decision I made in the best interest of my family and our country. I accept full responsibility for my actions. We are joined now by Paula Reed, who is outside the courthouse where Flynn, Flynn entered his plea. Paula, what, uh, what is essentially does the special counsel get in exchange for this plea? That's the question we've been asking all morning, Anthony. And newly released court documents give us some insight into what specifically Mike Flynn is going to give the special counsel. And it is significant. According to these newly released court documents, Mike Flynn will testify that before he met with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak, he personally spoke with a senior official of the presidential transition team, who he will also testify was with other senior members of the presidential transition team down at Mar-a-Lago. He says they had a long conversation about what, if anything, he should discuss with the Russian ambassador. And specifically, the transition team told him that they did want him to talk about sanctions and also how not to escalate this situation between the United States and Russia following sanctions that had been put forth by the Obama administration. Now, this is very significant because this takes the onus off of Mike Flynn for having initiated this meeting with with the Russian ambassador and shows that this was actually directed by the president's transition team. So this is a very valuable piece of evidence for Robert Mueller in his ongoing investigation into Russian influence in the 2016 campaign. Just to be clear here, Paula, what this suggests is that Flynn was directed by the campaign, possibly the president, to reach out to Russia. I want to stick very specifically to the language in the court documents because this is what he is testifying uh, before a judge. This is what he's told the grand jury. He specifically says senior officials of the presidential transition team who was with other senior members of the president's transition team. There is no specific mention of the president in this part of these documents. So at this point, yes, they are saying that he was directed by the president's transition team to have this meeting with Sergei Kislyak and specifically to discuss sanctions and ways to not escalate the situation 
tension between the U.S. and Russia. Paula, this it's a very serious charge that um, Michael Flynn has pleaded to. He was he he's 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 agreed to plead to lying to the FBI while he was in fact in the White House as national security advisor in January. But he was being investigated for some some more very significant charges, was he not? Absolutely. Sources have confirmed that at least half a dozen witnesses have come here to federal court to testify about Michael Flynn's business dealings, specifically the lobbying that he did on behalf of Turkey and Russia. So that tells us that very likely Robert Mueller had more than enough information to indict Mike Flynn and potentially his son as well on what are called FARA or failure to register as a foreign agent violations. Those are those are very significant charges. There were also some other legal questions about whether or not he could have violated federal law Recent in talking Korean. about uh, U.S. policy without you know, formally being uh, in the administration. But Anthony, the special counsel has been willing to overlook all of that evidence that has been presented over the past six to eight months and allowing him to, to plead guilty to making false statements. That told us that Michael Flynn had something really valuable to offer Robert Mueller. And here we're seeing part of what he was offering. And this is incredibly significant because, again, it shows that this meeting was at the behest of the transition team. Paula Reed outside federal court. Uh, I want to bring in Jeff Pegues now, who's in our Washington bureau. Jeff is our Justice and Homeland Security Corps. Responded. Jeff, what does this mean for the investigation now? Well, that obviously it is proceeding and getting closer to the president's inner circle. Let me just set the scene here. I mean, one thing that comes out with this plea agreement is how hyper focused investigators are, are on Flynn during the transition and then into the White House. Keep in mind, after he became national security advisor, Four days after the inauguration, he was questioned by the FBI and then 18 days later fired uh, or about 18 days later fired after it was revealed that he was compromised. And again, it was the acting attorney general at the time, Sally Yates, who went to the White House and warned them that they felt, investigators felt, that Mike Flynn was compromised because he hadn't uh, accurately described his contacts with the Russian ambassador. And at the time, uh, U.S. intelligence officials and law enforcement officials had access to these intercepts, these electronic intercepts that involve conversations between Sergei Kislyak and Michael Flynn, in which sanctions was discussed, even though, uh, according to the vice president, uh, Mike Flynn had told him that that was not the case. And so investigators at that time felt that he was compromised. So this is an important part of this investigation, that period uh, between the transition and those first few weeks uh, in the administration for Michael Flynn. Jeff, what, what did the what did what do law enforcement officials believe? I mean, what was their belief in looking at at these intercepts and the information they had about uh, the reason that that Flynn was acting and reaching out to the Russians? Well, listen, let's go back a year. December of 2016, the Obama administration was intent on sending a message to the Russians, uh, a punishment, if you will, for interfering for meddling in the 2016 election. How did they do that? Uh, they felt one step toward doing that was announcing these sanctions against certain people within the Russian uh, government. And so uh, when those sanctions were undermined, there were people in the intelligence community and the law enforcement community who were frankly shocked and surprised because uh, the behavior of the Russians at that time was so, quote, un-Russian like. Typically, when sanctions are announced, you would have some sort of reaction from the Russian government. But in, in this case, that didn't happen. And so as these intercepts came out, there were people in the law enforcement community who felt like they were being undermined, that the Obama administration was being undermined. Around the same time, you had a certain Obama administration officials coming out and saying that there is one president at a time because they were seeing these interactions and they were concerned about them. And their suspicion was that perhaps Mr. Flynn was being directed by, by somebody else? Well, that was the suspicion that he would not have done this on his own. Uh, I was told that multiple times during mm -hmm. that period. They always felt that he was being advised or encouraged to make those contacts. All right. I want to bring back uh, Paula Reed uh, again, who is outside the federal courthouse uh, where Mr. Flynn uh, entered his plea today. Paula, uh, what what happened in the conversation with Ambassador Kislyak? 
All right, Anthony, I'm reading very closely, tiny print here, the documents that have been filed by special counsel. This is what Flynn will testify to. He will say that immediately after he talked to transition officials, he called the Russian ambassador and requested that Russia not escalate the situation between it and the U.S. and only respond to U.S. sanctions in a reciprocal manner. Now, he says... Also, immediately after that call, the transition team wanted to know how it went. They wanted an update. So he was constantly in communication with the transition team about his conversations with the Russian ambassador, how they went. And then just two days after this conversation that he had with the transition team saying, yes, go talk to the Russian ambassador. Let's talk about sanctions in a way to tamp the situation down. Um, you see that Russian President Vladimir Putin on December 30th released a statement indicating Russia would not take retaliatory measures in response to U.S. sanctions. This is incredibly significant because this shows a very tight timeline and directly connects Vladimir Putin's actions to conversations that he was having with President Trump's transition team. Paula, what do we know about uh, when Michael Flynn made his decision to cooperate here? Do we have any sense of when he actually, when he actually tipped? Well, we know that they've been a steady parade of witnesses over about six to eight months. But a few weeks ago, something interesting happened, which was that several witnesses that work for a public relations firm who are expected to come here and testify, they were told to hold off. Then earlier this week, we knew that Flynn's lawyers stopped cooperating with the White House, stopped sharing information with them about the investigation. Then we also know that Mike Flynn's lawyers met with special counsel earlier this week. So it appears that they were at least getting closer to a plea deal over the past several weeks. And we know that based on what sources have confirmed to us about what was going on with the grand jury and what we've confirmed about Flynn not cooperating with the White House. So, Anthony, it appears that they probably were likely always trying to get a plea deal, but it seems to have sort of closed the deal in the past several weeks. And why do you, Paula, why do you think that he agreed to accept this plea deal? Well, it's not only Mike Flynn who is uh, under scrutiny here, it's also his son, Mike Flynn Jr. Both of them were potentially exposed to those, those foreign lobbying federal crimes that I talked about when you don't disclose the income or the work that you're doing on behalf of a foreign government. And while there's certainly an incentive for anyone to save themselves and, and, and offer what they have to avoid federal prison, there's even more of an incentive if your child is also, also potentially looking at a federal prison sentence. So based on the evidence that we know and the amount of charges that Robert Mueller could have potentially brought, all of these things come together is, is quite an attractive incentive to start talking. Once again, as Paula Reed has been reporting, uh, there is evidence Michael Flynn was directed by senior officials of the Trump transition team to make contact with the Russians. He has entered this morning a plea agreement uh, accepting charges that he lied to the FBI in January while he was national security advisor uh, in the Trump administration. The, we want to thank uh, Paula Reed uh, outside the federal courthouse there and Jeff Begay's in our Washington bureau. There will be much more about this on your local news on this CBS station and on our 24-hour streaming news network, CBSN, and right here tonight on the CBS Evening News. For now, I'm Anthony Mason, CBS News, New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. Well, there you have it. We are learning new information about uh, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn about what he pleaded guilty to today. He pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI, but now we know a little more about the details. He lied to the FBI about a meeting that he had with uh, Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. But what we're learning in his uh, plea agreement and what he said today was that there was ongoing uh, interaction between him members of uh between flynn kislyak and also flynn and members of the senior members of the transition team in fact michael flynn says that he was directed to make contact with uh, kislyak and talk about something specific talk about those sanctions and the escalation of those sanctions uh, i want to bring in uh, cbsn political contributor and republican strategist alex 
Conant. So Alex, this is really sort of bombshell information. What Michael Flynn is saying is that members, senior members of the Trump uh, campaign team, the Trump transition team, directed him to make contact with Russian officials specifically to talk about the easing of um, sanctions. And then what we see shortly after that conversation is Russia announcing that they would not retaliate against those sanctions being imposed by the Obama administration. I got to get your reaction. You know, what do you make of this news? Well, it's interesting news. It, it, I don't think it's a big shock to anybody who's been closely following this story. We found out a few weeks ago that Flynn had cut off contacts with the White House counsel and President Trump's lawyers on this matter, which seemed to indicate that he was likely to make some sort of a plea deal with the uh, with the, with the special prosecutor, which we now found out that he has in fact done. The underlying charge here that somehow the Trump administration was working with the Russian government during the the transition remains to be seen. First of all, is that actually accurate? Is is the special prosecutor investigating that? And if so, what are the consequences of that? How is that illegal? And if so, who broke the law? And what are the consequences to that? And then what is the potential political fallout? I've already seen on a lot of conservative media that we've we've already seen people supporters of the president saying, "Well, that's not a big deal." Of course, Trump and his supporters were and his aides were talking to the Russians during the transition. There's nothing improper about that. So I think the political fallout remains to be seen. It's not good news for the for the president who clearly wants to put this behind him as soon as possible. But how bad is this story? That remains to be seen. Well, you actually make a sort of very interesting point there, Alex, um, because, you know, the president was asked about this, was asked, um, I think maybe in, let me see when this press conference happened. In, in February, he was asked whether or not he directed um, Michael Flynn to make contact with the Russian ambassador. He said, no, he didn't. But he probably would have if he didn't think it was happening. He actually didn't take issue with Michael Flynn making contact with Kislyak. He took issue with him lying to the uh, vice president, which is the reason that he was fired. But the Trump, but President Trump really had no problem with this sort of contact at all. Well, that's exactly right. And, and that's what you see his supporters saying on TV already in response to uh, CBS is reporting and, and others reporting, indicating that Trump was fully aware and, in fact, directed Flynn to uh, make these contacts. I, I think the larger political issue is going to be what may or may not have happened during the campaign and what mm -hmm. Flynn knows about that. Remember, that that's that was what uh, Mueller was originally assigned to do, look into the campaign, not necessarily the transition. Right. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I want to sort of make it clear that uh, the context that we're talking about is uh, Michael Flynn saying that it, there were senior members of the Trump transition team that instructed him to uh, make contact with Sergei K Kislyak and specifically bring up the sanctions. But, you know, Paula Reed is standing by. She's our Justice Department uh, correspondent. And you've been uh, sort of going through all of the documents and finding out the details of what exactly uh, Michael Flynn uh, pled guilty to. What can you tell us? I'm going to read these newly revealed court documents from the special counsel. And Marie, this is somewhat of a bombshell. Flynn has agreed to give Robert Mueller very significant information about what the Trump transition team was doing in relation to Russia. We've known all morning Flynn must have given Robert Mueller something to get this plea deal. Now we know more what he said. Specifically in these court documents, it states that Mike Flynn will testify that before speaking to Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak, he contacted senior officials of the Trump transition team. They were in Mar-a-Lago. There were several members present for this meeting, and they discussed whether or not they should talk to the Russian ambassador and what they should talk to him about. And they decided that they should talk to him about sanctions and how not to escalate the situation between the United States and Russia. This is incredibly significant because it takes the onus off of Mike Flynn for having initiated this meeting on his own and shows that the Trump campaign was actively sort of trying to shape foreign policy between the U.S. and Russia during the transition. It's a really interesting stuff. And uh, these charges are pretty serious. I mean, he's facing... A significant amount of time behind bars in terms of and a significant fine. 
Yes, though I will say, I'm going to use uh, General Petraeus uh, as, as a sort of corollary mm -hmm. here. He also had a, had a mishandling classified information case. He wound up only pleading guilty to making false statements to the FBI. He didn't actually serve any jail time. He was put on probation. He, he had to pay a very hefty fine. Um, so it's not a guarantee that Mike Flynn will actually go to prison over these charges. But of course, they're, they are significant. But Anne Marie, they're a lot less significant than what Robert Mueller could have brought. They've had over half a dozen witnesses come here before the grand jury to testify about Mike Flynn's business dealings. He could have charged him with, with many, many more counts. He could be facing a much steeper sentence. Again, this is all part of a plea deal. He's agreed to plea to this in exchange for not being charged with everything else. And now it's clear why. Reading these court documents, he's given Mueller some valuable information. He certainly is. Um, Alex, let's talk a little bit about the political uh, implications. I know you say that it's not clear that there will be any sort of significant political fallout, but you know, here on a day that the Senate is uh, hammering out their uh, tax reform bill, and they're actually, you know, pushing it through. It looks like they're going to have enough votes, um, and they're probably going to vote tonight. Maybe they will be able to do this before the end of the week. This is what we should be talking about, and we're certainly not talking about it. That's right. I mean, this is arguably both both the best and the worst day of the Trump administration so far. Uh, the best because it looks like he will get a big legislative win having the Senate pass the tax reform bill, which I think makes it very, very likely that the president will be signing tax reform into law by Christmas, as he's, as he's uh, promised to do. Uh, but it's also the worst day because this plea deal by Flynn makes it clear that the investigation will go on for a long time to go. The plea deal makes it all but certain that Flynn is going, or excuse me, Mueller is going to target other members of Trump's team. Other members of Trump's team are in serious legal jeopardy following this plea agreement. Yeah, and again, you saw in the the, the statement that. Uh, the Trump's lawyer put out following the news this morning, they want this wrapped up yesterday. Trump has been telling people reportedly that he thinks this will be over by New Year's. And it's clear that this, this will not be over by New Year's. This will now bleed into next year. Uh, and it will continue to be a huge distraction for this president and, and a huge both political and potentially a legal problem for him. So both th th this Friday is... December 1st, I think, will be remembered as both the, one of the best days of his administration, but potentially also one of the worst. All right. Jeff Begay's Homeland Security correspondent. Is this a new phase in this investigation? Well, it's a new phase in that you have this former very senior uh, White House official now in this position. Uh, but you can also look at it this way. I mean, the fact that uh, the special counsel's office now has this plea deal with Michael Flynn it takes the investigation into the White House, right? I mean, that's where this is headed. If you're an investigator looking into, well, who was Mike Flynn consulting with? And then, you know, during that period that uh, the acting attorney general was so concerned that uh, he was compromised, what was going on in the White House during that period? And also, by the way, uh, during that period, uh, the president was meeting with James Comey and then, uh, urging him to drop the Flynn investigation. So, you know, if, if the special counsel's office is at this point where they have a plea deal for uh, Mike Flynn to cooperate, uh, you can almost bet that they are also looking into uh, his actions and other people's involvement in his actions uh, in the White House. Uh, and so when you ask me whether this is a, a, a new phase, well, in that way it is. You know, in reading these documents, what we see is that uh, members of the transition team spoke to Michael Flynn about making contact with uh, Russian, the Russian ambassador, um, and he did so, and he talked about sanctions. And then shortly after that, uh, there was a, a public announcement made by the Russians saying that they would not retaliate for sanctions that were implemented by the Obama administration. And then you see the ambassador talking to Michael Flynn again, and then Michael Flynn uh, relaying that information from that conversation to the transition team. Is this odd or is this just what happens uh, during a transition? You know, the president spoke shortly after uh, Michael Flynn was let go and said that, no, he never told Michael Flynn to make contact with the Russian ambassador. But if he knew that it was, if he thought it wasn't happening, he probably would have instructed him to do it. 
Well, some of it is easily explained away as just part of a, a transition and sort of, sort of standard operating procedure. But you have to look at this uh, and put it in perspective. Think about the campaign, 2016 campaign, uh, and the Obama administration saying that the Russians had meddled in the campaign. And during that period, the FBI and others are trying to figure out, well, what was the motivation for these Russian operatives and Russia in general with the blessing of Vladimir Putin to try to interfere and meddle in this campaign. So all of that is happening at the same time that Michael Flynn is in contact with Sergei Kislyak and no one is sort of fess fessing up to that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, U.S. intelligence, U.S. law enforcement, they're seeing these contacts. They're seeing the intercepts, which show that they're conversations. And then on the other hand, they're seeing people deny that there are these contacts. So if you put it in, in perspective with the atmosphere at the time, which was unusual, then it's sort of, it starts to make sense why this is a little different and why investigators at the time and even now saw that period as a little different. Something unorthodox is happening here and we have to look into, well, why is this happening and who is in contact here? And then you had these statements from the Obama administration. Uh, I remember, remember them at the time, you would hear uh, senior administration officials say at that time, well, there's only one president at a time. Uh, and so they were saying these things for a reason. They were seeing these uh, interactions and frankly, they were seeing their policies being undermined. Um, Paula, what we're learning from these documents is that um, Michael Flynn spoke to senior members of the transition team in Mar-a-Lago. Is that significant? I think it might be, and Marie, um, I cannot confirm at this very second where the president was on this date on December 29th uh, when this conversation happened. But when I read these court documents, uh, it did strike me as odd that they included the location of where the transition team was. The point of the evidence is the conversation and the content of the conversation. But Robert Mueller is, is a very, uh, very strategic, very specific, methodical individual. It suggests that perhaps that detail of their location is included to raise the specter or raise questions about the extent to which the president was also in the loop on this. But I will say very adamantly, there is no mention in the court documents that the president directed this. That's very interesting. So a little bit of a breadcrumb, uh, if you will. But like I said, the president in a press conference, I think in February, said that he certainly did not direct uh, Michael Flynn to make contact with the Russian ambassador, but he didn't have a problem with it. And Jeff, it occurred to me when you were sort of uh, laying this all out that once again, it looks like we're seeing a case of it's the cover up and perhaps not the incident that is the issue that gets you in trouble because it's the fact that he lied to the FBI is what they're getting him on here. Well, and, and we'll have to see where this goes. Uh, in fairness, we, we don't know yet where this is going to going to end, right. but we know that there is still a lot of investigating uh, to come, and we know that there are several other people who are under scrutiny right now. We've been reporting on that. Uh, but also keep in mind, this is just one person, Michael Flynn. There are others who have been cooperating, George Papadopoulos for one, but there may be people that, that we don't quite know about yet who've been cooperating as well and filling in the blanks as investigators try to put this big puzzle together because there are so many aspects of this investigation. There is the period of the campaign from, uh, let's say, March 2016 all the way up to the election. And then after the November election, there is the transition and what happened during that transition. And by the way, why wasn't Michael Flynn screened? There were people in the Obama administration who felt like he wasn't the type of person that you should have in that type of position because of his past. In fact, it has been widely reported that President Obama advised Mr. Trump that, in his words, Mike Flynn is a bad guy mm -hmm. uh, or something along those lines. Now, there were people close to President Trump who felt like, well, maybe that was said in jest and they didn't really take it seriously, 
But there were warnings there about Michael Flynn. And then, oh, by the way, there was the trip to Russia in December of 2015 when he sat right next to Vladimir Putin. And there is an, a picture of that. Uh, and so there, there were signs there, troubling signs, uh, that people in law enforcement and in the intelligence community felt like should have been heeded when it comes to Michael Flynn. There were just uh, disclosures about payments that he was not making uh, that people found troubling. And now we see this plea deal today. We have a statement from uh, Nancy Pelosi. I'm going to read uh, portions of it for you here. It says, the guilty plea of President Trump's former national security advisor to lying to the FBI about his communications with Russian authorities marks a dark moment in our nation's history, disturbingly. Flynn is the fourth Trump campaign official to be charged in connection with the Russian investigation so far. All Americans should be alarmed by reports of President Trump's consistent efforts to obstruct the special counsel and congressional investigations. The American people deserve to know what the president knows about Russian meddling in our election and why he refuses to take action against Russia. Alex Conant, you are a uh, Republican strategist. What, how do you advise, how would you advise the White House to play this? What should their response be? Well, what I've been advising uh, the White House and, and Republicans to do from day one is try to get ahead of the story. Mm. They continue to be behind the eight ball on this story, which is we, re we every day it seems like we are learning new information about who did what when during the campaign and during the transition. We're learning it from the newspaper and we're learning it from the special prosecutor and from court documents. We're not learning it from the White House, let alone from the president himself. There is going to be more bad news. We know that now. We know that Flynn, according to the plea deal, has spoke with other transition officials about his conversations with the Russians. It, it, I don't understand why the White House, from a political and from a communications perspective, would, would not proactively get those, trans, get those transition officials out in public and talking about their conversations with Flynn. Announce that bad news on your own terms. Don't wait for it to come in a, in a future indictment or in a future news report. They continue to not be able not be able to get their arms around the story. They are constantly responding to the events and responding to investigative reporting. And it, 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 it makes the story worse than it might otherwise be in the sense that uh, we, you know, rather than just having it all out there for and letting the chips fall where they may, and continues to drip, drip, drip. And now we're almost a year into this this president's first term in office or first year in office, and we still don't know all the facts. They they just need to get out in front of it. I understand that their lawyers might have some issues with with that strategy. But it now appears that the facts are coming out anyways. They might as well get out in front of it. Right. At times it certainly seems like that we would not be getting that information if it wasn't forced out of them. And we've you've seen sort of over and over again where um, members of the administration have had to admit to meetings um, that they, you know, initially said they, they did not have or then did not remember until there was some sort of confirmation either through an investigation or through the media. Um, the president's attorney issued a statement earlier uh, today that essentially said, you know, we were aware of the fact that Michael Flynn lied. That's why we fired him. There's sort of nothing to see here. Do you think the statement by the president's attorney was sufficient? Uh I mean, I think it will help get them through the news cycle, and mm. uh, we've already seen some of the president's supporters out on TV and in and, and the media uh, sort of echoing what the what the attorney said. And clearly, they're they're trying desperately to dis distance themselves even more from Flynn at this point, and and frankly, cast further questions about his credibility, uh, since he now looks like he will be testifying against uh, against the president's team. Yeah. So. I, I, look, I think it gets them through the uh, through the news cycle, but it does not turn the page on this chapter of of uh, of, of the investigation or in this this, this part of the uh, the scandal as it grows inside the White House. They have got to get in front of it. And by what I mean by that is like get all the facts out and get them out on their own terms. Don't wait for the special prosecutor or the media 
to discover all of this on their own. Get out in front of it. Look, this is this is crisis communications 101. If you have bad news, put it out on your own terms. Yeah. They have not done that on any single day uh, since we first learned about the Russia, uh, Russia scandal. Yeah, control the narrative. Um, Jeff, uh, where do we go from here? Um, what's the next move, do you think? And your sort of final thoughts on, on the news of the day. Yeah, I, I, you know, listening to Alex there, I don't, I don't know if you can get out in front of this mm. because there is just, you know, what we're reporting, the special counsel's office is probably known about for weeks. You know, so whatever we report on, they're probably 10 or 15 steps ahead. Uh, they are looking ahead and they are moving forward. We know that they are interviewing White House officials. And they've been doing that over the last couple of months or so, prominent White House officials. Uh, so we are still in a phase where the special counsel's office is hard at work investigating uh, this case, uh, trying to, it seems, get to the bottom of it. But the question is, well, wh when does it or when will it end? I know that the White House has said that by the new year, this will all be wrapped up, but that's not the case because we know that there are several other people uh, still under scrutiny. Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Carter Page, just to name a few, but there are many more names out there. Indeed, Alex Conant and uh, Jeffy Gase, thank you so much. The news of the day is a big one. Uh, Michael Flynn, a former uh, advisor to the president, uh, also an advisor throughout the campaign, has pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. He lied about meetings that he had with the Russian ambassador to the U.S. And in those meetings, he talks about sanctions against the uh, against Russia, about the lifting of those sanctions. Um, should the should President Trump should the, should Trump become the president? And what we are also learning is that Michael Flynn says he was instructed to have those conversations by senior members of the Trump transition team. It's a big news day and we have a lot of news to cover. We're going to continue to cover this. Also, the tax reform bill making its way through the Senate. Keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN.
I'm Diane King Hall at the New York Stock Exchange with your CBS in business headlines. Is Wall Street in for a Santa Claus rally? November finished with a bang this year, and December is often the best month for stocks. Since 1950, the broadest measure of U.S. stocks has risen more than 1.5% during the last month of the year. With the flip of a switch, the world's biggest battery is on to power up Australia's grid in time for that country's first day of summer. You'll recall Elon Musk promised to build the battery in 100 days or it would be free. Now, this could be music to a lot of investors' ears. Spotify could be going public this spring, according to Reuters. The music streaming service has a potential valuation of $20 billion. Americans are making more and spending more. The Labor Department says incomes grew by 0.4% in October and consumers boosted spending by a third of a percent. A troubling t-shirt is pulled from Walmart's website. A third party was selling a t-shirt about lynching journalists with the words rope tree journalists printed on it. Walmart was alerted to the shirt on Wednesday and yanked it off the website the same day. And those are some of today's top business headlines for CBSN. I'm Diane King Hall. We just had to leave the building because there was an aftershock. This is the third young white shark that we've seen brought on this lift just today. And behind me is the scene of another mass shooting. Worshippers in their small town church. The surf has really picked up behind us. Eight foot waves. What do you do? Better evacuate. Want real news right now? We've got the app for that. This is CBSN. We're just on the front lines. The police have surrounded the area. It's still unclear what caused this fire, why it spread so quickly. There are flooded homes like the one behind me for miles. Change is what many people here are looking for. And now they're trying to pin the eyes of gunmen down. The marchers were saying, let us march. We want to march. CBSN, CBS News, always on. Hi, everyone. I'm Lena Nynan. Thank you for joining us. President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, has pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI during their investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Break it down. Well, that was Flynn leaving the courthouse earlier today as people yelled, lock him up. That's a reference to the chant of lock her up that he started about Hillary Clinton at last year's Republican National Convention. It's now Flynn 
who faces possible prison time, but his punishment may depend on what he tells the special counsel's office. He has confirmed that he's cooperating. In a statement in which he also accepts responsibility for his actions, lying to the FBI about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman joins me here in New York. And CBS News justice reporter Paula Reed joins me from Washington to break all this down. Okay, Paula, I want to kick it off with you. This wasn't really the most serious charge that Flynn could have faced. What are you hearing right now? Absolutely. I mean, the fact is that over the past six to eight months, more than half a dozen witnesses have come here to federal court before the grand jury to testify about Mike Flynn's business dealings and especially his lobbying on behalf of Turkey and Russia and some things that he may not have disclosed to the federal government. That is a crime. That's what Paul Manafort and his associate were charged with. But Mike Flynn wasn't charged with these foreign lobbying violations. He was charged with making false statements. So the question is, OK, what did he give Robert Mueller in exchange for putting aside all that other evidence of foreign lobbying, failure to disclose violations? Well, we're getting some new details about that, Rena. Newly revealed court documents show us that Mike Flynn is willing to testify that before he spoke with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak, he spoke with senior members of the Trump transition team who directed him to have that conversation and specifically to discuss sanctions and how not to escalate the situation between the U.S. and Russia. Rena, it's fair to say that this is a bombshell in the Russia investigation and the most significant witness that Robert Mueller has secured so far. Ricky, we just heard Paula call this a bombshell. What do you make of the strategy that Mueller's using here? Well, I think that Bob Mueller is very smart, and I think that that is uh, probably not debatable. Number one is that he is doing what any good prosecutor would do, which is that you try to go up the chain. But if you look at Mike Flynn, you're pretty high up to start. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, who else does Mike Flynn have to give up? Paula hit on the key language, that is that uh, Mike Flynn is saying in his plea agreement, in the statement of the offense from the prosecution, that he was directed by mm -hmm. a senior member of the Trump transition team. We don't know at this point we, who that is. We have no idea who that is. But you have to know that the way this whole process worked is that Mike Flynn has cooperated as much as he possibly could in order to get this deal. Mm -hmm. This is a one count deal. It's a five year penalty. If you took the four false statements, you'd yeah. already be up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So he's he's been singing like a canary as the defense lawyers would say. So Ricky, how does this work? How do these plea deals work? Does the attorney say, here's what we got, here's what we're willing to tell you? Or could it be potential that Flynn says, you know what, actually it was all me. It had nothing to do with Trump. Or have we already passed, passed that at this point? Well, we for, certainly I want to say that we have no idea if this has anything to right. do with Donald Trump. We just don't know. Or does it have to do with someone else who was in the Trump campaign and the Trump transition team? But what happens is a smart lawyer says, I want to be the first person to the courthouse in the best interest of zealous representation of my client. So if I get there first and I can have a discussion with the prosecution about cooperation, then the prosecutor will let me know whether or not he, in the case of Bob Mueller, is interested. Then what happens is the defense lawyer goes back and gives what we call a proffer. A proffer is a statement of, if you will benefit my client by letting him plead to a lesser offense, this is the following information that my client can offer you. So you say up front what you have and what you're willing to tell them and what you're willing to provide. Yes, in this little bit of cat and mouse mm -hmm. of the negotiation, that is, the prosecutor says, well, depending on what you've got to give me, I may be willing to go down to four counts or three counts or two. In this case, one count of false statements, right. a five-year maximum, of which he will probably not do a day in prison mm -hmm. if, in fact, he cooperates fully and continues to do so. This is a great deal. Paula, what are we hearing? from White House lawyers responding to today's events? Well, consistently they've said that they're not concerned, even when there were signs that the Mike Flynn may be entering a plea deal. They, several of the lawyers said that this was to be expected. Nobody seems concerned, but they should be concerned. Not only is this, as Ricky noted, one of the highest level officials so far um, to start cooperating with the special counsel, these conversations bring evidence for Robert Mueller directly into the senior officials of the Trump transition team into the campaign and possibly 
depending on who these officials were, possibly directly into the White House. So despite what they say, this is not a great day for the White House in terms of Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 campaign. Paul, what do you make of the strategy that Mueller's using? And is there a sense uh, to gauge what could come next in this investigation? Well, when we try to guess what's going on in this investigation, we always have to remember that nobody was thinking of George Papadopoulos uh, right, exactly one month ago when he had his plea deal. So we know that there's always a chance he has some more tricks up his sleeves. What I try to go by when I'm trying to figure out what happens next is I look at the evidence that is being presented to the grand jury. We knew it was likely Manafort would be indicted because the witnesses that were going before the grand jury, they were testifying about his business, specifically his foreign lobbying. Same with Mike Flynn. We knew that over half a dozen witnesses had testified about him, which is why we thought it was very likely that he was entering a plea deal when his lawyer stopped talking to the White House. The other evidence that we know is going before, before the special counsel now is a lot of evidence about obstruction of justice. And I think that going forward, we're just kind of going to be watching that thread to see what happens. But in terms of reading the tea leaves or uh, what Robert Mueller is doing, Rena, Ricky, I got to tell you, this man is just, he is full of surprises and pretty secretive. Nothing about this plea deal leaked before it was released. That's a good point. Very good point. I want to ask you, Ricky, though, about Paul Manafort. When you complain how this went, when you compare how this went down with Manafort versus Flynn, what stands out to you? Well, the obvious thing that stands out is Paul Manafort didn't go to the courthouse through his lawyer to try to cooperate uh, with the special prosecutor. So now Paul Manafort is still left dealing with the uh, strict restrictions of his house arrest. So he's at some way preliminary stage saying I'd like more freedom while I'm waiting for my next day in court. So Paul Manafort can uh, either decide that he wants to go to the special prosecutor now, but he's a little late. Mm -hmm. So the second person to the courthouse or the third or the fourth or the fifth never gets the same benefit as the first huh. um, unless he has something extraordinary to give. Or Paul Manafort may say, I'm simply going to take my chances. I'm going to remain strong, tough, tall, as they would look at it, and not go in and cooperate. And I will take my chance at a trial. Um, that's always the way these things go when you have multiple players. You also have to remember this. We don't know if Paul Manafort has anything to give. Um, you may want to cooperate, mm -hmm. but if you don't have something really to give that's substantial, you can't. Mike Flynn obviously has had something to give. Mm -hmm. It is said that he was direct did, that's the word, by a senior official in the Trump campaign and transition team. That's someone to give. We don't know who that is. Paula, couldn't the president of the United States, President Trump, still pardon anybody who was found guilty? Yes, that possibility is is out there. Uh, some people have speculated that's what Paul Manafort is, is hoping for. Um, when you look at the charges that he is facing and all the evidence against him, some people have suggested that he's willing to take his chances in the hopes uh, of a pardon. Legally, yes, that is technically possible. One of the things about uh, the pardon, and Paula well notes, is that Paul Manafort may be saying, I think I'll get my pardon from the president or I'll take my chance that I mm -hmm. do. But you have to remember that Attorney General Eric Schneiderman in the state of New York has not let go of this case either. So if he goes in, to charges against Paul Manafort for things that happened within the jurisdiction of New York, the president cannot pardon for a state mm -hmm. crime. And pardons don't absolve you of guilt. They just absolve you the consequences of those charges. Correct. Ultimately. Ricky Kleeman and Paula Reed, I want to thank you both very much for joining us for your insights. Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that Republicans have the votes to pass their $1.4 trillion tax bill. The party holds only two seat, a two seat majority. That's 52 to 48. I mean, there's very little wiggle room at this point. And they need 50 votes with Vice President Mike Pence passing the tiebreaker. We're now learning one of the remaining GOP holdouts that Senator Jeff Flake says he will support the tax plan. In a new statement, he writes during the debate over the current bill, I focused on two specific objectives. The first was to eliminate the $85 billion expensing budget gimmick in the bill. 
The second was to obtain a firm commitment from the Senate leadership and the administration to work with me on a growth-oriented legislative solution to enact fair and permanent protections for DACA recipients. Having secured both of those objectives, I'm pleased to announce I will vote in support of the tax reform bill. Well, meanwhile, there are new details about a criminal investigation of disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Jerika Duncan has been following this story since it broke, and she has the very latest. Yes, CBS News has learned the Manhattan District Attorney's Office informed people involved in the case they are not looking to move forward in an investigation centered around rape allegations against Harvey Weinstein. Those allegations were brought forward by actress Paz de la Huerta, who says Weinstein raped her twice in 2010 while inside her New York City apartment. Now, the new revelation would be a stark change from just last month when the New York City Police Department announced the allegations were credible as they gathered information and evidence for possible arrest warrant. The DA also recently appointed a senior sex crimes prosecutor to the case. But when we reached out for official comment, the district attorney's office told us, as this remains very much an active investigation, we will decline comment. Paz de la Huerta's lawyer responded to the new reporting, telling CBS News the DA's office has copious amounts of evidence and no reason to delay indictment. They urged the district attorney to convene a grand jury by the end of next week or expect the protests to begin. Harvey Weinstein has vehemently denied any allegations of non-consensual sex. All right. Thank you very much, Jerika. Well, a former NBC top executive disputes reports that managers knew about Matt Lauer's alleged sexual misconduct. CNN President Jeff Zucker used to be the executive producer of the Today Show and Lauer's boss. And he says he was unaware of any problem when their host, when the host during their during their time at the Today Show. There was never a, uh, a complaint about Matt. There was never a suggestion of that kind of deviant predatory behavior, not even a whisper of it, nothing like that. So, uh, you know, I can't, uh, uh, I can't. Uh well, according to Variety, several women complained to executives at the network about Lauer's behavior, which fell on deaf ears. But the network says, quote, prior to Monday night, current NBC News management was never made aware of any complaints about Matt Lauer's conduct. Longtime Today Show host faces allegations ranging from lewd comments to indecent exposure and sexual assault. In a statement, Lauer said, quote, some of what is being said about me is, is untrue or mischaracterized. <coughs> but there is enough truth in these stories to make me feel embarrassed and ashamed. Well, Def Jam founder Russell Simmons is stepping down from the record label and his other businesses amid allegations of sexual assault against him. Screenwriter Jenny Lumet accused Simmons of sexually violating her in 1991. She's known for the movies The Mummy and Rachel Getting Married. Simmons says his memory of the encounter differs from Lumet's. But he acknowledged her feelings of fear and intimidation, saying he chose to step down from his companies so he wouldn't be a distraction. And Marie Green has more. Writing in The Hollywood Reporter, Jenny Lumet says Russell Simmons initially offered her a ride home in his car, but instead he brought her to his New York City apartment and forced her to have sex. I felt dread and disorientation, she wrote. I wanted to go home. I said I wanted to go home. Matt Bellany is The Hollywood Reporter's editorial uh, this director. Is, this was clearly a traumatic and intimidating and harrowing experience for her. She was locked inside this car and didn't really have a choice about what happened to her. Hours after Lumet went public with her accusations, Simmons' brand took a hit. HBO announced Simmons will not appear in the new series All Deaf Comedy and was removing his name from the show. As the co-founder of Def Jam Recordings, Simmons helped turn Public Enemy, The Beastie Boys, I'll crush you like a jelly bean. And LL Cool J into stars. His business empire now includes a yoga studio, energy drinks, a fashion label, and film and television production. Simmons Seven appeared on CBS This Morning in July. And I like to give people what I love. That's my entrepreneurial things. On Thursday, Simmons said, While I have never been violent, I have been thoughtless and insensitive in some of my relationships over many decades, and I sincerely and humbly apologize.
Well, Lumet says that she came forward after Simmons denied forcing another woman into sex. Last week, model Carrie Klasha, Klaschen, Klaschen, Kleja said Simmons forced her into performing oral sex in his apartment when she was only 17. Simmons denies her allegations, saying everything between them was consensual. Well, coming up after a break, where are they going? The search continues for a teenage girl who appears to have disappeared with her soccer coach. And an undocumented immigrant is acquitted in the murder of a young American woman. It's a case President Trump used repeatedly on the campaign trail. We'll have the president's reaction. You're streaming CBSN. A new report finds major faults with the way Charlottesville police handled a white nationalist rally that turned deadly last August. 32-year-old Heather Heyer was killed when a man rammed his car into a group of counter-protesters at what had been dubbed the Unite the Right rally. 19 other people were injured in that incident. 14 more were hurt in other clashes over two days. Two state troopers also died when their helicopter crashed. The report compiled by a former U.S. attorney says the situation may not have escalated with better communication and better coordination. The report says, quote, this represents a failure of one of government's core functions, the protection of fundamental rights. Law enforcement also failed to maintain order and protect citizens from harm, injury, and death. Charlottesville preserved neither of those principles on August 12th, which led to deep distrust of government within this community. CBS News transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve joins me now from our D.C. Bureau. Chris, this investigation has been ongoing for months. What are the main findings from all of this? Well, you know, the, the main findings were very little went right when it came to dealing with this demonstration. You know, David Begno, myself, and Paula Reed were all down there covering uh, the events in Charlottesville, um, and particularly the aftermath of the accident you're watching, the attack, I should say, you're watching right now, where the vehicle drove through this crowd of people, uh, injuring 19 and, and killing Heather Hare. Um, basically, uh, some of the some of the highlights, uh, some of the headlines here, because there uh, it's a lengthy report. It's more than 200 pages, and most of it deals with things that did not go right. Uh, it, it really faults the Charlottesville police and the Virginia State Police for failing to separate 
uh, demonstrators. As you can see the fighting on the screen right there, one of the strategies you would use in a protest where you know it's going to be contentious, and they had intelligence to know it was going to be contentious, uh, is to keep the groups separated. There was not a good plan in place to do that outside of Emancipation Park. They focused on the park, not the ways in and out of the park, and of course that's where the people were interacting, were outside of the park. The state police were told they were there to protect the park, so they stayed behind barricades. Uh, the Charlottesville police were told not to intervene in violence unless it was serious or potentially life-threatening. And that brought up, and I'm, I'm going to read you from the report here because I think it's important, we did not find evidence of a direct order to officers to stand down and not respond to fights and other disorders. Even if there was no explicit stand-down order in place, Charlottesville Police and Virginia State Police both failed to stand up to protect human life. Supervisors devised a poorly conceived plan that under-equipped and misaligned hundreds of officers. Um, many of these officers had never even put on their body armor before. Uh, the body armor was kept a good distance away from where they were, so you had to pull everybody back to put it on. Uh, many of these officers had never even been trained in sort of these, these big field exercises. The lieutenant that was leading it for the Charlottesville police had never led an exercise like this. There, there was no training. Uh, the radios between Virginia State Police and, and Charlottesville Police don't talk to each other. And let's talk about the intersection uh, where that car struck all of those people. Initially, there was one officer stationed there. She was a school resource officer. She was a police officer. She had a gun. Um, but she typically works in, in, in an elementary school and had just come off two months of leave from elbow surgery. She was concerned about her safety. She asked for backup. Instead, she was pulled off of that intersection, leaving only a sawhorse of a roadblock that somebody moved out of the street. The traffic commander didn't know she'd been removed, uh, and no officers, even though there were officers available, no one was sent to that intersection or, or to protect the Charlottesville Mall, this pedestrian area, from vehicle traffic. Also, there were several SWAT teams that were already in tactical gear that have experience with these sort of situations that were never utilized. Uh, the, the list of failures in this report, uh, frankly, is stunning and goes on for page after page after page. It's incredible, Chris, to hear you go down that list. But do you get the sense from this report that maybe police underestimated the threat and that could be one of the reasons why it turned so deadly? You know what's interesting, one of the things the report says went right is that the Charlottesville Police Department had plenty of accurate intelligence as to what was coming their way. Huh. Uh, and you know, they said they think Friday night, think back to the, the University of Virginia where those, uh, the, the white uh, supremacists were wa walking with those torches through the campus. Well, the University of Virginia knew that rally was coming for hours. Uh, their officers did not. Uh, intervene uh, until well downstream of that. They did not uh, accept mutual aid offers from the much better staffed Charlottesville police. Um, so there was a, a, a weak response Friday night that uh, the, the report writers believe set a tone and emboldened demonstrators on Saturday that the police weren't going to respond. And as it turned out, there's even body camera video that was reviewed that showed citizens asking police to intervene and stop fights and officers not doing it because they had been ordered only to get involved in serious violence. Wow. You certainly hope that this is a report that police departments all across this country will be looking at. Chris Van Cleve, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Sure thing. Well, President Trump is slamming the acquittal of an undocumented immigrant in a murder trial that sparked a national debate over illegal immigration. Jose Inez Garcia Zarate was accused of killing Kate Steinle in San Francisco in 2015. He admitted to using the murder weapon, but he says it was an accident. Steinle was killed by a bullet that ricocheted off the ground. It's a case President Trump used repeatedly during the campaign to justify a policy of mass deportation. And he called the jury's verdict disgraceful on Twitter last night. Well, this morning he wrote, quote, the Kate Steinle killer came back and back over the weakly protected Obama border, always committing crimes and being violent. And yet this info was not used in court. His exoneration is a complete travesty of justice. Build the wall. He went on to say that the jury was not told that the killer of Kate was a seven time felon. The Schumer Pelosi Democrats are so weak on crime that they will pay a big price in the 2018 and 2020 elections. In reality, Zarate has no history of violence, although he is a repeat offender. John Blackstone has more from California. Following the not guilty verdict, defense attorney Matt Gonzalez condemned the way the case had been politicized by President Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions. And they may themselves soon avail themselves of the presumption of innocence 
and the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. And so I would ask them to reflect on that before they comment or disparage the result in this case. About three hours later, President Trump tweeted a disgraceful verdict. No wonder the people of our country are so angry with illegal immigration. The killing became a centerpiece of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. Another victim is Kate Steinle, gunned down in the sanctuary city of San Francisco. Kate Steinle was walking with her father on a San Francisco pier when the 32-year-old was shot in the back. Soon after, police arrested Jose Inez Garcia Zarate, an undocumented immigrant who'd been deported to Mexico five times. He'd recently been released from the San Francisco jail, but under sanctuary city policies, had not been turned over to immigration authorities. In court, however, defense attorneys argued Garcia Zarate found the gun under a bench on the pier and it fired accidentally. The bullet ricocheted and hit Steinle 78 feet away. Garcia Zarate is not a free man. He was found guilty of illegal possession of a firearm, which could carry a sentence of up to three years. He also faces deportation again. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Francisco. Well, the search continues for a Florida teenager who disappeared with a high school soccer coach almost a week ago. 17-year-old Caitlin Frizena was last seen in her home on Saturday. She's been spotted by surveillance cameras along the East Coast with 27-year-old Ryan Rodriguez. Police believe that they may be heading for Canada. Meg Oliver is in Lake City, Florida, where she spoke with Caitlin's mother. Why do you think she left? I don't know. We've gone over that question in our minds um, a thousand times since this happened. Scarlett Frasina is trying to make sense of why her teenage daughter, Caitlin, would take off with Ryan Rodriguez, a 27-year-old the family considered a friend. I know that she, to some degree, left on her own. But I absolutely believe that she was lied to and totally misled. If this was his idea, what did he take from you? My baby girl. Every time I turn around, there's something that reminds me of her. Scarlett says everything seemed normal in the weeks leading up to her daughter's disappearance. Is it possible she was leading a secret life? Well, that's what we, we wonder. Something was going on. We just don't know what. Caitlin's father, Ward, was too upset to sit down with us. Scarlett says he blames himself since he encouraged Rodriguez to apply for the coaching job. He said, I can't believe I put not just my child, but other people's children in this kind of environment. That's hard for him. What's even harder for both of them is the uncertainty. I look like a teenager right now glued to my phone, but I just, what if she gets a chance to call me? What if somebody has seen them? What if the sheriff's office got the call? I'm going to answer that call. You know, I'm going to make sure that we're there. Scarlett Fresina says she is worried about her daughter and Rodriguez running out of money and not being able to buy food and warm clothing. Reports that they were last seen at a pawn shop only amplifies that concern. Meg Oliver, CBS News, Lake City, Florida. Well, the case of two Georgia men accused of dragging a black man to his death behind a pickup truck will go before a grand jury. Timothy Coggins died in 1983. And now William Moore Sr. and Frag Frank Gerbhardt face a felony murder charge. A Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent testified during a probable cause hearing that the two men bragged about Coggins' death. He said the men stabbed Coggins nearly 30 times before chaining his body to a pickup truck and dragging him into the woods. Three other people are also facing charges. Police say a fire that damaged nearly two dozen buildings in Cohost, New York, has started by, was started by a man intimidate, imitating a TV show. They say that it was an accident. 51-year-old John Gomez was trying to bend metal, like on the History Channel show Forged in Fire, when he started a barrel fire that spread. Three of the buildings were completely destroyed. At least 20 people were displaced. The mayor called it the worst disaster in the city's history. Gomez has been charged with reckless endangerment and arson. Well, coming up after a quick break, Senate Republicans are on the verge of passing their tax bill. There's a hitch. An unpartisan report says it would add tr a trillion plus dollars to the deficit. And Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says that reports that he may be out of a job are, quote, laughable. 
But White House sources say they're considering it. They're streaming CBSN. Well, boy, has it been a busy Friday on Capitol Hill as Republicans are racing to whip up support for their tax bill. John Cornyn, the Senate's second ranking Republican, says they do have enough votes to pass the massive plan to change the country's tax code. Some in the GOP were hesitant to support the bill because of the findings of a nonpartisan report showing that it will add one trillion dollars to the deficit. Mola Lenghi has more from Capitol Hill. Senators got back to work this morning hammering out the GOP's tax overhaul bill. This after a long night of debate and then a Republican rewrite behind closed doors. The bipartisan Joint Committee on Taxation projects the bill would add another $1 trillion to the deficit over 10 years. But most Republicans don't buy it. I think the JCT scoring is highly questionable. But a few GOP deficit hawks, like Tennessee's Bob Corker, want to cut the bill's price tag. He's backing an idea to roll back some of the tax cuts after six years. So is your vote resolved then? Uh, we're still working. Republicans believe regardless of the projections, the bill will pay for itself. They say large corporations need a large tax cut in order to compete globally. And that will stimulate economic growth here in the U.S. The current proposal takes corporate tax rates from 35 to 20 percent, but some corporations have already indicated their tax savings would not necessarily lead to increased wages or job creation. The evidence shows that that actually doesn't happen. What it shows is that we see debt paid down, mm -hmm. share buybacks, and we should mention more money going to line top executive pockets in the terms of more incentives. But many Republicans say while the bill is imperfect, it's important to take advantage of the momentum. No Democrats support the bill. Mola Lenghi, CBS News, Capitol Hill. CBS News congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes joins me on, phone, on the phone from Capitol Hill. Nancy, boy, what a busy day on Capitol Hill. What's your sense right now from Republicans about where this is going? They feel very confident at this hour, Rena. Most of the Senate Republicans we have spoken to, even the ones who have been holding out in recent days, say that they believe the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, when he says that he now has the 50 votes that he needs. Some of those holdouts haven't, haven't officially put out uh, press releases saying that they're on board, but they're saying things like, it's moving in the right direction, I'm feeling very good about it, and usually that's a signal that they are going to be on board at the end of the day. And this is a result 
of a lot of horse trading overnight. And then again this morning, they were sort of all huddled in a conference room off the Senate floor as leaders tried to make adjustments to the bill to satisfy in particular, some of these deficit hawks. But one by one, the proposals that those deficit hawks had made kind of went by the wayside. You recall that uh, first, Senator Corker of Tennessee was proposing some kind of trigger that yep. would uh, roll back the tax cuts if the tax cuts didn't result in the kind of economic growth that Republicans say they will. Um, but they figured out that there was just no way to make that work under Senate rules uh, that are allowing them to pass this bill with 50 votes and instead of 60. So then they moved to Plan B. Corker really wanted to shave about $350, $400 billion worth of cuts from the bill, so it wouldn't impact the deficit quite so much. Um, and a lot of Republicans revolted against that idea. They said, no, we want bigger tax cuts, not smaller tax cuts. So it's not clear right now that Corker himself will be on board at the end of the day, but he doesn't need to be because Republicans can afford to lose one or two of their own members. Mm. You talk about the horse trading man. So to get some of these re Republicans on board, what do they have to agree to? Well, uh, in the case of Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, for example, his big issue was that there wasn't enough being done for small businesses, that um, all of the, the biggest tax cuts and incentives were aimed towards big corporations. And so uh, it sounds as if leaders are working into the bill uh, a larger deduction for small businesses uh, so-called that use so-called uh, pass-through taxes and so that appears to have been enough to gain his support um, Susan Collins of Maine is another one who was holding out um, and she was able to secure uh, a, a return to a deduction for property taxes up to ten percent, up to ten thousand dollars, rather, and that's something that's in the House version as well. Uh, between that and a few other things that she was able to get worked into the bill, she looks like she's going to be a yes. Uh, the big question mark is, you know, they've made all these promises, but now Republican leaders actually have to work those details into the bill before they can pass it. So nobody's really seen the final version. And they're hoping, still hoping, that they can get that done by this evening so that they can vote this week before senators go home. So this is, a, this is truly a case where senators will be passing a bill that could have a $1 trillion impact on the deficit without having a chance to see it before they vote on it. Incredible. So let's say this does pass the answer today. What's the next step? The next step is that you then take this Senate bill and you try to meld it with the version that passed the House in November, which is quite different in many ways. That work has already been going on quietly behind the scenes, um, but Senate and House Republicans are not going to let any grass grow under their feet. They're going to work as quickly as possible, uh, and that is really three-dimensional chess because uh, there are Republicans in House and Senate who are wedded to various um, aspects of these two bills that are going to eventually, some of them are going to have to go by the wayside because they're in direct con contradiction to what's in the other bill, and they've got to they gotta try to, to take these two bills and just turn them into one. And so that's going to be a very difficult process. They've got to compromise and yet, you know, keep in mind that this will have to get voted on again by the House and the Senate, so you can't afford uh, to lose too many senators or House members because they're missed that something that, that they had been promised would be in the bill is no longer there. Um, and so then the House and the Senate vote again, and then if it passes, it goes to the president's desk. Incredible. Well, we're going to keep checking in with you, Nancy, throughout the afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Our Nancy Cortez on Capitol Hill. Great to be with you, Rena. And as we mentioned earlier, Rick, action in Washington is still pouring in after President Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. Flynn appeared in court today. The charge is in relation to the special counsel investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. A statement by Flynn reads, my guilty plea and agreement to cooperate with the special, the special counsel's office reflect a decision I made in the best interests of my family and our country. I expect full responsibility for my actions. Flynn worked in the Trump administration and on his campaign, but the president's team is trying to downplay his role. His attorney released a statement quoting here, Today, Michael Flynn, a former national security advisor at the White House for 25 days during the Trump administration and a former Obama administration official, entered a plea to a single count of making a false statement to the FBI. 
The false statements involved mirror the false statements to the White House officials, which resulted in his resignation in February of this year. CBS News political director Steve Shigaris is in Washington. He joins us now. Okay, Steve, so this is the fourth official connected uh, to Trump to be charged. How much trouble is this going to be for the president to try and distance himself from Flynn? Well, that uh, that statement you just read is a, a nice try, but there's really, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy, Michael Flynn, who was a, an advisor to the campaign for almost a year before the election, uh, and then was a significant part of the transition team, which is when uh, this uh, this call to the Russian ambassador happened. Uh, and then, yes, okay, so he was in the administration for 25 days, and he was a former administra Obama administration official. But neither of those are relevant to the overall argument, which is that Michael Flynn is really the most important person right now that Mueller has dragged into this, who is ch charged with something. Uh, and he has things to talk about. And I think one of the reasons why we see uh, the uh, uh, what he's been charged with, he could have been charged with a lot more than just lying to the FBI. Uh, but the, the, the we know that the reason why he hasn't been charged with as much is because he's going to talk. What is he going to talk about? Well, uh, we're finding out that prosecutors are saying that uh, Flynn told uh, them that a senior transition official had directed him to make that phone call to the Russian ambassador, the phone call that he misled the FBI about. Uh, who's that senior transition official? That's the big question. That's what I think people are going to be looking at here. The president can't distance himself from this because more and more people are getting roped into all of this. You talk about those folks getting roped in. The fact that Flynn's agreed to cooperate with the special counsel's office, what do you think it means for the other members of President Trump's inner circle? Well, it means that they're going to be asked a lot of questions. First of all, going to try to find out who that senior transition official is. Is it somebody who was involved with the campaign? And was it somebody who was involved, currently involved with the administration? And if so, uh, what did that person know? Uh, what did that person do, not just in this case, but in terms of other contacts with Russia? That is the real impetus for the special counsel's investigation here. How does this all uh, tie back to the original uh, impetus for this investigation, which is did the Trump campaign or did President Trump uh, collect or work with the Russian government to uh, meddle in the uh, 2016 election. Now, this specific incident that Michael Flynn is involved with is not, it happened after the election, but could all this tie back to people who were involved in the campaign that might be able to answer that question? That's where Mueller's going with this. You know, Steve, back in March, President Trump tweeted that Flynn should, quote, ask for immunity. That was before the special counsel. What kind of questions does it raise about the president's tweeting? Well, it raises questions on what does the president know, right? And we still haven't, and even with what happened today, we still haven't tied anything directly to President Trump. Again, what, who's, who's being tied to uh, Flynn in this case is a, quote, senior transition official. Uh, that is not President Trump. So the president can continue to say, uh, no one's investigating me. I'm not a, a, a target of the investigation. However, they're trying to figure out, uh, the, the Bob Mueller, the special counsel, is trying to figure out how can they get closer to the president if there is a way to get closer to the president. And uh, they're going to try to try to continue to connect those dots but the president himself not directly tied to this yet uh, we don't know if if he will be or not uh, we don't know uh, whether the president's going to be uh, dragged in for questioning or if he's going to be charged with anything uh, but uh, you know that uh, that that is something to think about down the road it's something that the president um, you know, is probably thinking about it, uh, uh, which is on his mind. I don't want to get into the president's head on this, but uh, this is an investigation he believes uh, is overblown and what he's called a witch hunt. And I think he'd like to see an end to it. I mean, there, were, there was reporting out last night that says he's talked to uh, members of Congress who were involved in uh, their own Rus Russia investigation and asked them to speed up their investigation or to end it soon. I think he wants this cloud, which is a cloud over his administration, to dissipate. And I don't think, uh, well, we know now after what happened with Michael Flynn today, it is not going away anytime soon. Right, our Steve Shigaris coming to us from Washington. Steve, thank you very much Thanks, for weighing Rena. in. Yeah. You bet, allies, uh, Republicans move closer to overhauling the entire U.S. tax system. They're selling it as a middle class tax cut, but is it really the case? Bloomberg Business Week editor Megan Murphy spoke to CBS this morning about who the real beneficiaries are. There's no question that this bill in its present form in both the Senate and the House is a massive transfer to the wealthy. You can look through any of its provisions in terms of taking the corporate rate down, in terms of taking the individual rate down and pass their rate down. We could go on and on. But the problem they face now is on two fronts. One is on a practical level, as we've discussed. Their own projections, independent projections, show that it's not going to be able to pay for itself. In fact, it's a trillion dollars short over the next 10 years. And only taking GDP up uh, projected 0.8% over the next 10 years. That's not nearly enough to pay for the bill. 
on a theoretical level, they face the problem that so many economists just don't believe that what we call trickle-down economics, that cutting the top rate of tax for corporations, for individuals, does enough to stimulate economic growth. And in fact, doesn't address the central conundrum in America, which is that wages just aren't rising mm. among middle class and working fa class families fast enough. So a major selling point for supporters of the plan is the reduction of that corporate tax rate. Also, CEOs from Pfizer and Coca-Cola say that they would pump those returns, those gains to shareholders. The economy is doing well. What can the economy stand to benefit from that? Well, this is the whole argument, is will companies use that money that they're getting back to pump into investment and, and key, expand job growth, invest in companies, invest in manufacturing? But the problem is the evidence shows that that actually doesn't happen. What it shows is that we see debt paid down, mm -hmm. share buybacks, and we should mention more money going to line top executive pockets in the terms of more incentives. In fact, what we've seen over the last several decades, not just in America, but in other countries, is it's boosting the lowest people on the rungs of society that actually stimulate faster economic growth. This bill, if you make under $30,000, you're actually going to be paying more in taxes. Hmm. So the people who earn the least in this country are going to be paying more. The people who make the most are going to be paying a lot less. less. Well, the president appears to be ready to shake up his cabinet once again. CBS News confirms that top White House aides have signed off on a plan to remove Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. His most likely replacement will be CIA Director Mike Pompeo. On Friday morning, Secretary Tillerson called the idea, quote, laughable. Chip Reed has more from Washington. Three, two, one. President Trump officially rang in the holiday season and a new year may bring big changes to his cabinet. Do you want Rex Tillerson on the job, Mr. President? He's here. Rex is here. Tillerson was at the White House Thursday and the president suggested that meant his Secretary of State was still on the job. His spokeswoman dismissed rumors that a change was imminent. When the president loses confidence in someone, they will no longer uh, serve in the capacity that they're in. But CBS News confirms there's a plan to put CIA Director Mike Pompeo at the State Department, replacing him with either retired Vice Admiral Robert Harward or Arkansas Senator and Trump loyalist Tom Cotton. I'm proud to be representing the people of Arkansas. Would you like to be CIA Director? <laughs> I'm very proud to be representing. We're going to interrupt to take you to Capitol Hill. You see there, Senator Mark Warner is reacting to the guilty plea of former Trump advisor Michael Flynn. Warner, as you may know, is the vice chairman of the Senate Select Intelligence Committee. Let's listen in. We see this constant pattern one after another, and, and it's, again, why this investigation needs to continue, why we owe the American public the full explanation. Um, but uh, the administration's effort to continually dismiss all of these figures, I'll be anxious to hear what they say when their national security advisor, again, pleads guilty in terms of, of lying to the FBI about his contacts with Russians. Do you have Senator, any knowledge of who? this <clears throat> investigation one step closer to proof of collusion? Listen, I think we have got more work to do, and we're going to do the take as long as it takes to get all of the facts. You know, it, it uh, we've got a number of major figures like Donald Trump Jr. I want to bring back Jared Kushner, particularly in light of some of the supposed comments that General Flynn may have been making. Um, we've got other individuals like Michael Cohen and others that we still need to come back. But I, we've got more facts to gather. But um, there seems to be this, you know, we've got now two people pleading guilty. We've got a campaign manager and his deputy still under indictment. Uh, how many more figures have to be brought to justice because of their ties with Russia uh, before we end up connecting all these dots? Senator, do you do you do Listen, I, that, I believe that we need to give everybody the benefit of the doubt but until we get all the facts. But um, I'm going to be very anxious to see, since it was obvious that General Flynn was in a great deal of legal, legal jeopardy. And it's a bit curious that he seemed to have pled guilty to only one charge. So my hope is that General Flynn will tell everything he knows and tell why he was having these contacts with Russians, who directed these contacts. Uh, I think it goes well beyond the fact that he just lied to the FBI. Do you have any knowledge of who these presidential transition officials were who did direct him to have these conversations with the Russians? And again, I, I'm anxious to wait for General Flynn uh, 
to come clean, and I hope uh, that uh, Special Prosecutor Mueller will uh, get that information out because the American public deserves to know. And do you have confidence in Richard Burr and carrying through this yes. this investigation? Why the president <coughs> pressuring to end the Russia? Yes. I think the chairman has made very clear that. He felt he needed to keep his distance from the White House, and we are continuing to work in a way. We're getting all the witnesses that we need to see, and there are a number that, uh, like Mr. Kushner and others, that we're going to want to invite back. Um, this investigation is going to continue in its bipartisan fashion, and we're going to get the job done. What's the next shoe to drop? You know, the <clears throat> truth is, this is a story that you, you can't make it up. It, it, it is, you know... It's still remarkable to me uh, that as we see senior intelligence officials appointed by this president acknowledging the massive Russian intervention, we've seen the social media companies that at first resisted but now acknowledge the massive Russian intervention. Uh, frankly, virtually every one of my Republican colleagues uh, acknowledges Russian intervention. The one individual that still seems to deny that this is not a major issue is Donald Trump. And I just kind of wonder why. Uh, so, again, we'll see where this story leads. Well, you need to talk to, well, you need to talk to Vice President Pence, given that he was the head of the transition while these conversations were occurring. And you know, I, I don't, we don't, as many times you ask, we don't share, you know, who we'd like to talk to or when we'd like to talk to folks. Um, again, I think... Uh, uh, I have a great deal of confidence in Special Prosecutor Mueller. Uh, I'm anxious to hear you know, General Flynn's full explanation of his contacts with the Russians. Uh, clearly, he was willing to lie about those contacts and lied to the FBI. And I'm anxious to hear from him a fuller explanation of who all directed him to have these contacts. Given what you've seen in the documents, though, do you have any concerns about potential for the vice president to Again, I'm not going to share. Not asking who you're bringing I'm, I'm in. Not gonna, I'm not going to share. You know, our investigation is ongoing, and you know I think what we owe the American people is all the facts. And we've still got more folks to talk to, and um, you know we want to get this job done, but we want to be complete. And again, one more, you know, that we've seen some, uh, and obviously including the president, who said, "Hey, you know, nothing here. Let's try to shut this down." Uh, I don't think there's anybody that's following this story now in light of. Another uh, admission of guilt coming from a senior Trump official, this time the National Security Advisor, uh, that we don't owe the American public to follow through on this investigation until we get all the facts out. Did Senator, Last Burr, did Senator Burr previously tell you about this conversation with Trump? I am. The focus is, you know, are we going to be able to do this investigation in a way where we get access to all the witnesses? We are going to do that. And I think, again, I was, I was proud of what the chairman said that, uh, in his in the New York Times story that uh, um, you know, he acknowledged that you know, he needed to stay away from the White House. But what is, what's, what's the real issue here is you've got this repeated pattern of the President of the United States who's trying desperately to stop this investigation cost Jim Comey his job because he wouldn't stop the investigation. He intervened with senators. He intervened with other senior intelligence officials. Uh, you know, I think the American people and a lot of us ask, why is he so desperate to have this investigation stopped, particularly as we see more and more people either plead guilty or come forward under indictment. Okay, we gotta go. Thanks. Senator, thank you very much. We heard there from Senator Warren there at, on Capitol Hill saying there's still much more to be looked into in this investigation. He said he'd also like to hear from Donald Trump Jr. Uh, as well as Jared Kushner again. We're continuing to monitor all the activity on Capitol Hill, including a potential vote on a tax bill. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, though, a royal debut. Prince Harry, Meghan Markle make their first public appearance together since announcing their engagement. You're streaming CBSN.
Well, the newly engaged royal couple attended their first official engagement together. Prince Harry and fiance Meghan Markle visited a charity fair in Nottingham, England to mark World AIDS Day. Crowds lined up to see the couple. Terry Okita has the story. Prince Harry's fiance Meghan Markle stole the show at the couple's first royal meet and greet. Hundreds lined up early in the English city of Nottingham to get a glimpse of the American who won the British prince's heart. Yeah. Megan, she looks beautiful, doesn't she? We're so happy for them both. We are. Well-wishers waved British and U.S. flags to welcome the newly engaged couple. It's lovely. It's fantastic. Prince Harry and Markle visited a charity fair to mark World AIDS Day, a cause close to the heart of Harry's late mother, Princess Diana. They're just delightful. Um, I'm obviously very starstruck, but they're incredibly approachable, very human. In cities across the UK, excitement is building for Harry and Meghan's royal wedding, especially here in Windsor. The couple will marry at the castle next May. Mike and Melanie Manch are visiting from Pittsburgh and are happy to hear Harry is marrying an American. He must really really, really love her to kind of circumvent tradition. I just think it's adorable. Everybody loves a romance story. The couple says the first thing they connected on was their passion for humanitarian work. It's one of the first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world. Can you show us some skills? They stopped by a school Friday to support a program that steers young people away from violence. Prince Harry and Markle say they feel strongly about change and look forward to creating it together. Terry Okita, CBS News, Windsor. Yes, everybody does love a good love story, don't they? Well, coming up in our next hour, the president's former national security advisor pleads guilty to lying to the FBI. He's cooperating with investigators, but what's he telling them? And Republicans close in on passing their tax plan in the Senate. They say it's a middle-class tax cut. What is it? We'll look into it. And could Secretary of State Rex Tillerson be out of a job? White House sources have floated the idea. We'll have the latest. Hi everyone, I'm Lena Nyman. Thank you for joining us. President Trump's former National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn, has pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI during their investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Can you please testify against the president? Break it down. 
Well, that was Flynn leaving the courthouse earlier today as people yelled, lock him up. That's a reference to the chant of lock her up that he started about Hillary Clinton at last year's Republican National Convention. It's now Flynn who faces possible prison time, but his punishment may depend on what he tells the special counsel's office. He has confirmed that he's cooperating. In a statement in which he also accepts responsibility for his actions, lying to the FBI about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman joins me here in New York. And CBS News justice reporter Paula Reed joins me from Washington to break all this down. Okay, Paula, I want to kick it off with you. This wasn't really the most serious charge that Flynn could have faced. What are you hearing right now? Absolutely. I mean, the fact is that over the past six to eight months, more than half a dozen witnesses have come here to federal court before the grand jury to testify about Mike Flynn's business dealings and especially his lobbying on behalf of Turkey and Russia and some things that he may not have disclosed to the federal government. That is a crime. That's what Paul Manafort and his associate were charged with. But Mike Flynn wasn't charged with these foreign lobbying violations. He was charged with making false statements. So the question is, OK, what did he give Robert Mueller in exchange for putting aside all that other evidence of foreign lobbying, failure to disclose violations? Well, we're getting some new details about that, Rena. Newly revealed court documents show us that Mike Flynn is willing to testify that before he spoke with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak, he spoke with senior members of the Trump transition team who directed him to have that conversation and specifically to discuss sanctions and how not to escalate the situation between the U.S. and Russia. Rena, it's fair to say that this is a bombshell in the Russia investigation and the most significant witness that Robert Mueller has secured so far. Ricky, we just heard Paula call this a bombshell. What do you make of the strategy that Mueller's using here? Well, I think that Bob Mueller is very smart, and I think that that is uh, probably not debatable. Number one is that he is doing what any good prosecutor would do, which is that you try to go up the chain. But if you look at Mike Flynn, you're pretty high up to start. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, who else does Mike Flynn have to give up? Paula hit on the key language, that is that uh, Mike Flynn is saying in his plea agreement, in the statement of the offense from the prosecution, that he was directed by mm -hmm. a senior member of the Trump transition team. We don't know at this point we, who that is. We have no idea who that is. But you have to know that the way this whole process worked is that Mike Flynn has cooperated as much as he possibly could in order to get this deal. Mm -hmm. This is a one count deal. It's a five year penalty. If you took the four false statements, you'd yeah. already be up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So he's he's been singing like a canary as the defense lawyers would say. So Ricky, how does this work? How do these plea deals work? Does the attorney say, here's what we got, here's what we're willing to tell you? Or could it be potential that Flynn says, you know what, actually it was all me. It had nothing to do with Trump. Or have we already passed, passed that at this point? Well, we for, certainly I want to say that we have no idea if this has anything to right. do with Donald Trump. We just don't know. Or does it have to do with someone else who was in the Trump campaign and the Trump transition team? But what happens is a smart lawyer says, I want to be the first person to the courthouse in the best interests of zealous representation of my client. So if I get there first and I can have a discussion with the prosecution about cooperation, then the prosecutor will let me know whether or not he, in the case of Bob Mueller, is interested. Then what happens is the defense lawyer goes back and gives what we call a proffer. A proffer is a statement of, if you will benefit my client by letting him plead to a lesser offense, this is the following information that my client can offer you. So you say up front what you have and what you're willing to tell them and what you're willing to provide. Yes, in this little bit of cat and mouse mm -hmm. of the negotiation, that is, the prosecutor says, well, depending on what you've got to give me, I may be willing to go down to four counts or three counts or two. In this case, one count of false statements, right. a five-year maximum of which he will probably not do a day in prison mm -hmm. if, in fact, he cooperates fully and continues to do so. This is a great deal. Paula, what are we hearing? from White House lawyers responding to today's events? Well, consistently they've said that they're not concerned, even when there were signs that the Mike Flynn may be entering a plea deal. They, several of the lawyers said that this was to be expected. Nobody seems concerned. 
but they should be concerned. Not only is this, as Ricky noted, one of the highest level officials so far um, to start cooperating with the special counsel, these conversations bring evidence for Robert Mueller directly into the senior officials of the Trump transition team into the campaign and possibly depending on who these officials were, possibly directly into the White House. So despite what they say, this is not a great day for the White House in terms of Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 campaign. Paul, what do you make of the strategy that Mueller's using? And is there a sense uh, to gauge what could come next in this investigation? Well, when we try to guess what's going on in this investigation, we always have to remember that nobody was thinking of George Papadopoulos uh, right, exactly one month ago when he had his plea deal. So we know that there's always a chance he has some more tricks up his sleeves. What I try to go by when I'm trying to figure out what happens next is I look at the evidence that is being presented to the grand jury. We knew it was likely Manafort would be indicted because the witnesses that were going before the grand jury, they were testifying about his business, specifically his foreign lobbying. Same with Mike Flynn. We knew that over half a dozen witnesses had testified about him, which is why we thought it was very likely that he was entering a plea deal when his lawyer stopped talking to the White House. The other evidence that we know is going before, before the special counsel now is a lot of evidence about obstruction of justice. And I think that going forward, we're just kind of going to be watching that thread to see what happens. But in terms of reading the tea leaves or uh, what Robert Mueller is doing, Rena, Ricky, I got to tell you, this man is just, he is full of surprises and pretty secretive. Nothing about this plea deal leaked before it was released. That's a good point. Very good point. I want to ask you, Ricky, though, about Paul Manafort. When you complain how this went, when you compare how this went down with Manafort versus Flynn, what stands out to you? Well, the obvious thing that stands out is Paul Manafort didn't go to the courthouse through his lawyer to try to cooperate uh, with the special prosecutor. So now Paul Manafort is still left dealing with the uh, strict restrictions of his house arrest. So he's at some way preliminary stage saying I'd like more freedom while I'm waiting for my next day in court. So Paul Manafort can uh, either decide that he wants to go to the special prosecutor now, but he's a little late. Mm -hmm. So the second person to the courthouse or the third or the fourth or the fifth never gets the same benefit as the first huh. um, unless he has something extraordinary to give. Or Paul Manafort may say, I'm simply going to take my chances. I'm going to remain strong, tough, tall, as they would look at it, and not go in and cooperate. And I will take my chance at a trial. Um, that's always the way these things go when you have multiple players. You also have to remember this. We don't know if Paul Manafort has anything to give. Um, you may want to cooperate, mm -hmm. but if you don't have something really to give that's substantial, you can't. Mike Flynn obviously has had something to give. Mm -hmm. It is said that he was direct did, that's the word, by a senior official in the Trump campaign and transition team. That's someone to give. We don't know who that is. Paula, couldn't the president of the United States, President Trump, still pardon anybody who was found guilty? Yes, that possibility is is out there. Uh, some people have speculated that's what Paul Manafort is, is hoping for. Um, when you look at the charges that he is facing and all the evidence against him, some people have suggested that he's willing to take his chances in the hopes uh, of a pardon. Legally, yes, that is technically possible. One of the things about uh, the pardon, and Paula well notes, is that Paul Manafort may be saying, I think I'll get my pardon from the president or I'll take my chance that I mm -hmm. do. But you have to remember that Attorney General Eric Schneiderman in the state of New York has not let go of this case either. So if he goes in, to charges against Paul Manafort for things that happened within the jurisdiction of New York, the president cannot pardon for a state mm -hmm. crime. And pardons don't absolve you of guilt, they just absolve you the consequences of those charges. Correct. Too, ultimately. Ricky Kleeman and Paula Reed, I want to thank you both very much for joining us for your insights. Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that Republicans have the votes to pass their $1.4 trillion tax bill. The party holds only two seat, a two seat majority, that's 52 to 48, meaning there's very little wiggle room at this point. And they need 50 votes with Vice President Mike Pence passing the tiebreaker. We're now learning one of the remaining GOP holdouts that Senator Jeff Flake says he will support the tax plan. In a new statement, he writes, during the debate over the current bill, I focused on two specific objectives. The first was to eliminate the $85 billion expensing budget gimmick in the bill. 
The second was to obtain a firm commitment from the Senate leadership and the administration to work with me on a growth-oriented legislative solution to enact fair and permanent protections for DACA recipients. Having secured both of those objectives, I'm pleased to announce I will vote in support of the tax reform bill. There are new details about a criminal investigation of disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Jerika Duncan has been following this story since it broke, and she has the very latest. Yes, CBS News has learned the Manhattan District Attorney's Office informed people involved in the case they are not looking to move forward in an investigation centered around rape allegations against Harvey Weinstein. Those allegations were brought forward by actress Paz de la Huerta, who says Weinstein raped her twice in 2010 while inside her New York City apartment. Now, the new revelation would be a stark change from just last month when the New York City Police Department announced the allegations were credible as they gathered information and evidence for possible arrest warrant. The DA also recently appointed a senior sex crimes prosecutor to the case. But when we reached out for official comment, the district attorney's office told us, as this remains very much an active investigation, we will decline comment. Paz de la Huerta's lawyer responded to the new reporting, telling CBS News the DA's office has copious amounts of evidence and no reason to delay indictment. They urged the district attorney to convene a grand jury by the end of next week or expect the protests to begin. Harvey Weinstein has vehemently denied any allegations of non-consensual sex. Well, any moment now, an attorney for Congressman John Conyers is expected to speak. Conyers has been hospitalized amid calls for him to resign over sexual misconduct allegations. As soon as that begins, we'll take you there live. Well, former NBC top executive disputes reports that managers knew about Matt Lauer's alleged sexual misconduct. CNN president Jeff Zucker used to be the executive producer of the Today Show and Lauer's boss, and he says he was unaware of any problems with the host during their time at Today. There was never a, uh, a complaint about Matt. There was never a suggestion of that kind of deviant predatory behavior, not even a witness.